Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on Sunday, September 9th, 2018. This is episode 1522. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Qualcomm Snapdragon. According to Ookla, Android smartphones with Snapdragon 845 from Qualcomm had faster data speeds on AT&T and T-Mobile than non-Android phones with Intel modems based on over a million real-world tests done in Q2 2018. See all the data for yourself at qualcomm.com slash twit. And by Slack. Slack is a collaboration hub for work that makes sure the right people on your team are always in the loop and key information is always at their fingertips. Learn more at slack.com. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yes, we're talking computers, your worst nightmare. Actually, I guess it isn't. It's not fair to call it talking computers. Really, right? We're talking technology. Computers, yes, but the internet also. Home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, augmented reality, all that jazz. We got, we talk about that each and every weekend here. And it's kind of, I kind of enjoy it. Because uh, to me, it's a chance to talk about how our world is changing, how you can get the most out of technology. Sure, a lot of times we talk about the pitfalls of technology, the security issues. But it's also really making things easier. It, even if it doesn't make things easier, it's 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 the agent of change. And isn't that you know, that's interesting to me anyway. I always think of this show as the toy store, though. We're not going to talk about horrible events in the world. We can leave those out. Uh, we, we're talking about toys essentially. Although I did want to talk a little bit about security today, and in particular about what uh, Wired Magazine calls the most devastating cyber attack in history. I've mentioned this a couple of times. Maersk, M-A-E-R-S-K, is a big shipping company, one of the best, biggest in the world. Uh, you've seen those big Maersk container ships going around, right? Huge ships that contain uh, you know, all sorts of goods, ship them all over the world. June 27th, 2017, something terrible happened. Wired Magazine writes, Confused Maersk staffers began to gather at a help desk in twos and threes, almost all of them carrying laptops. On the machine's screens were messages in red and black lettering. Some read, Repairing file system on C, with a stark warning not to turn off the computer. Others, more surreally, read, Oops! Your important files are encrypted and demanded $300 in payment to unencrypt them. You probably know what I'm talking about now because some of you have seen this. All of you have heard about ransomware. And this is the most devastating cyber attack in history. Not Petya, which hit the entire company of Maersk. Eight business units, 574 offices, 130 countries around the globe with Maersk offices, all of them turning black. One of the IT guys said, I saw a wave of screens turning black, 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 black. They were being irreversibly encrypted and locked by ransomware all across Maersk headquarters. By the way, this is Andy Greenberg writing uh, for Wired Magazine. He's great. All across Maersk headquarters, the full scale of the crisis was starting to become clear. Within half an hour, Maersk employees were running down the hallways, yelling to their colleagues, turn off your computer, or disconnect it from the network before the malware could infect it. As every minute went by, dozens or hundreds more machines were corrupted, infected, made useless. Tech workers ran into conference rooms and unplugged machines in the middle of meetings. Soon, staffers were hurtling over locked key card gates, which had been already paralyzed by the malware. Yeah, that's right. More than just computers. Those computers go down. Suddenly, you can't get through gates. You can't open doors. Things stop working. Maersk, the maritime giant, 
responsible for 76 ports on all sides of the earth, 800 seafaring vessels, including container ships carrying tens of millions of tons of cargo, representing close to a fifth of the entire world's shipping capacity, dead in the water. Thanks to Not Petya. Not Petya. Now, here's the real irony. Not Pretya spread over the network, right? That's what was going on. I mean, as long as these computers are connected to the Merce company network, they were getting infected. It spread over the network using a technique invented by the United States National Security Agency. Hacking tools the NSA had created to hack, you know, spies and bad guys that inadvertently escaped... In, uh, in a release of ultra-secret files earlier in the year. Bad guys found this exploit. It's called Eternal Blue. It lets the virus spread over the network. They combine that with uh, an already extant uh, malware called Mimikatz. Some French security researcher created that in 2011. <laughs> when, they were when they were combined... <laughs> Eternal Blue and Mimi Cats, you can infect computers that aren't patched. You can grab passwords from those computers to infect other computers that are patched, and pretty soon the entire network goes down. $10 billion in total damages worldwide, not just Maersk, but FedEx, a French construction company, food producer Mondelez, $10 billion, even the Russian oil company, Rosneft, brought to its knees by not Petya. And Maersk, by the time this was all over, it, it, it stopped their business. It took them a long time to get everything working again. Even though I'm sure they had backups, Maersk ended up declaring a $300 million loss on their tax return that quarter. Thanks to not Petya, the ransomware. This is a great story. If you haven't read it in uh, Wired magazine this month, it's uh, well worth reading. The story of how NotPetya was created, <clears throat> how it worked, and the very dramatic stories of how it spread throughout these companies. Maersk ended up basically using paper and pencil <laughs> to, <laughs> to keep the business sort of limping along. It took them about two weeks to, uh, to get the company back on its feet, mostly by giving new computers to everybody. They had to give everybody new computers. <laughs> what a crisis. What, a, what an amazing uh, story. The company uh, took 10 days to rebuild their entire network, 4,000 servers, 45,000 PCs. All because an NSA exploit leaked, was combined with a kind of a minor virus invented by a researcher some years earlier to make one of the most devastating cyber attacks in history. We don't know who did it. Still don't know who did it. We don't know how it happened. And frankly, here's the real problem. The thing that worries me the most, we don't know how to keep it from happening again. You listen to the show because, I hope, you enjoy this stuff, but also I hope you listen when I talk about the things you need to do, like keeping your system up to date, you know, how to configure your router. Antivirus stop software wouldn't have stopped this. I'm sure Maersk had antivirus software. It was a, what they call a zero-day exploit. It was so new, it had never been seen before that none of the antiviruses knew about it or could block it. it really requires you and your alertness. But even then, even then, there's nothing Merce could do. <sighs> All right, let's take a break. I want to take your calls. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're taking calls, answering questions. Let's kick things off. A visit back to uh, my mom and dad's old hometown, Leonia, New Jersey. Bob. Hi, Bob. Good to talk to you again. Ooh, oh, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> for, uh, Yesterday, I think I helped your uh, wife organize her photos. What, what can I do for you today? Uh, she was thrilled. Oh, good. Putting a thumbs up every time she hears me trying to get through to you. <laughs> Let's see what Leo says. 
Yeah, I'm just. We were talking about Google Photos yesterday, and I was just looking now because of that at the at the my Google Photos in the sharing section, and it automatically suggests. Oh, you know, uh, your wife would love these pictures. It's really cool. Oh. Really nice. Yeah. I'm thrilled. Okay, so let me let me sneak in my next question because yes. I know there must be a million people who also want to get uh, get your expertise. Okay, uh, um, on her iPhone seven, she has ten point iOS ten point oh. I know that you always say update, update, update. I'm always afraid to update because every time I've done an update or an upgrade or whatever you call it, um, something doesn't work. Something it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't go exactly as smoothly. Right. As right. If I'm dealing with you, you know. Yeah, I know. I know the feeling. Well, here's the good news. Uh, iOS 12 is about a month off. It'll come out when the new iPhones come out actually it's i take it back it's about it's not much maybe it may be three days off maybe a week off it's soon so it's safe to go to ios 11 now uh i would do it i would absolutely do it uh it's very reliable you're right there were problems when it first came out but that's more than a year ago now right. uh, or almost a year ago now and uh i think it didn't hurt to wait but she's going to want to do it now. And uh, uh, iPhone 7 is a recent enough phone. She's not going to see any problems with it. I tell you what, she, I'm very excited about the next version of iOS, iOS 12. I've been using the beta now for some months. It's been very uh -huh. solid on my iPhone 10 and my iPad Pro. Uh, it's in good shape. And it has a, some interesting new features, including Siri suggestions, uh, which, which are really enhanced Siri. I, I don't know your experience with the voice assistant on the iPhone, on, on, on Siri, but... Not, not very good. Yeah, it's frustrating. Really, I don't particularly yeah, like Yeah, it. it's frustrating. So Apple's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, uh, they want to make their assistant smart. They're competing with Amazon's Echo, Google's assistant. They, they, they want to make it smart. But Amazon and Google know a lot about you. Amazon knows everything you've ever bought. Everything you've ever watched on Amazon, uh, they, they have a lot of information. They know where you live. They know where you work. They know a lot about you. So their assistant can be smarter. Google knows even more about you. Uh, and so their assistant can be pretty smart. For instance, my Google assistant knows when I'm going to the airport. They'll even pop up a thing that says, hey, your flight's uh, two hours off. You better leave now. And then when I get to the airport, pops up the ticket. I mean, it, it's really useful but it does that by invading my privacy. And Apple's always said, oh, we don't want to, you know, we want to, your privacy's paramount. So they've been kind of a little laggard as a result. Siri just can't get as smart uh, because they're not willing to spy on you. So they did a very interesting thing with the next version of iOS. They, uh -huh. they palmed off the privacy on apps. So this hasn't, this, this won't start until iOS 12 is out. And on a lot of phones, that'll be in the next couple of weeks then application developers will start turning this feature on. For instance, they showed the Pete's Coffee app. That's a coffee place out here in, uh, mm -hmm. in Northern California. And uh, they, Pete's notice that you buy something on their app every morning at 8 a.m. Uh, in the example, Apple gave a mint mojito, which is disgusting. But the Pete's app will then say to Siri, hey, Siri. Oops, I shouldn't have said that out loud. Sorry if I woke up your Siri. He'll say, yo, Siri, uh, did you know that uh, that uh, every morning at about 9 a.m., Bob's buying a mint mojito coffee? Why don't you remind him and give him the option to buy it? So instead of Siri knowing this, the, the app knows it, but the app is informing Siri, and Siri will then pop up a reminder saying, hey, Usually you buy a mint mojito coffee. You want me to buy it for you now? And you can say yes. You And then from now on, when you, you can say things like, yo, Siri, uh, buy me a mint mojito coffee, it'll know oh, that's the Pete's app. I'm going to launch that and do that. So apps are going to start taking what they know about you and making Siri smarter. I think this was a clever move on Apple's part. It, they're not invading your privacy. The apps are. They don't. <laughs> so so uh, Siri is going to get smarter, and this is all going to happen in iOS 12. There's a lot of nice new features. I think I, I you know, there's those memojis. I don't know if your wife is into that kind of thing. Yes, yes she likes those, too. yes. Yeah, well, uh, iOS 11 added the, the, uh, the uh, animated kitty cat and all of those things. iOS 12 lets you do it with your own face. Ah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, you get, get high on mint mojito coffees and then start making silly videos for your family and friends. <laughs> I think that 12 is better. iOS 11 was really bad. Apple really did a bad job. Your wife was probably smart not to update to iOS 11. It's because of you. Because of you. Well, I was I saying that, looking, yeah. Listening to you say that. Yeah. And I said, oh, we're not doing it no matter what. And <laughs> it was okay. But I said, did I'm it waiting until I get through now, and I speak to you personally. Didn't the iPhone keep bugging you? Like all, hasn't it been oh. bugging you all year saying you should really upgrade? Oh, yeah. Every 15, 20 minutes. Of fire, oh, I was man. Leaving messages. How did you, so, how did you survive? <laughs> it's going to do it itself in the middle of the night if I don't do it now. That's so annoying. Gosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Apple really wants you to update. Uh, to be fair, so does Microsoft now. Everybody does because it's safer. You, you can't. Can we update directly from 10.0 to 12? You can. And so, okay. given that you've do, you've completely given up on iOS 11, uh, what I would do in general, what I would do, uh, so so 12 is going to come out right around the announcement about the new iPhones, which is this week, okay. and then uh, usually it comes out either uh, the Thursday after that, so that the iPhones are available. For, we still don't know, but after the event, we'll know on Friday. Then uh, I would wait a week. Don't okay. be the first to install it. Wait a week. If there's a massive issue, you'll see it. You know, you can go to MacRumors.com, AppleInsider.com, 9to5Mac.com. Those are the three big Mac blogs. Our friends mm -hmm. at iMore.com. They'll all be howling if there's a problem. Don't install <laughs> iOS 12. Oh, my God, my printer stopped working or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I've been using it now for months without any problems. So I, I think this is not going to be like iOS 11. They got they they got the kinks worked out of 11. Uh, 12 is, in fact, they even said I think uh, about uh, eight months ago we heard that uh, Craig Federighi, who's in charge of iOS, got the team together. Maybe it was Eddie Q. Got the team together and said, "Look, 11 was kind of a problem. Let's focus on reliability." Let's not push too hard on new features. Let's make iOS 12 rock solid. And I, uh, my, right. yeah, my experience has been, in a way, I think you did the, you suffered, your suffering was not in vain. Okay, uh, good. Can I, can I go into an Apple store and have them do it? Sure. Instantly? They'd love to do that for you. Would, would that be the, the smartest way? No, to you can do it yourself. Just when it asks you, it's going to ask you. Wait a week, like I said, till the actual release. Read all the articles. When it asks you, just say, yeah, go ahead. And it's pretty fast and easy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's a good, that's a great, I think, I can't believe you deferred it for a year, Bob. <laughs> I listen carefully. And every time you, you got a call or you mention something about it's got a problem. This, don't wait for 11.3. Wait yeah. for 11.1. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you said, but it's working. I, I have no problem. I know. But Steve Gibson did. A lot of people did. Uh, and it was it notoriously ugly. Most a lot of the problems were cosmetic, but nevertheless, they had a lot of problems. Now, here's yeah. here's uh, um, one thing that you probably should do uh, before you do anything, before you do an upgrade: yeah. plug the iPhone into your computer right. and do an encrypted backup. Encryption will back up your passwords. So when iTunes launches, go to the go to the iPhone page and do a, a, a manual encrypted backup right before you do iOS 12. Because if for any reason you don't like iOS 12, you can restore that backup and go right back to the way it is now. To, to iOS 10? 10. Yes? Yeah. Go right back to the way your phone is at this at the moment you did that backup. Yeah. So if, if for any reason you're unhappy, uh, you, you, you have an exit. But only if you do that backup first. Okay. So it's called an encrypted backup. Yeah, so you'll see when so so you plug in your phone and there'll be some rigmarole. Do you trust this phone? Do you trust this computer? You say yes, yes, yes. Uh, iTunes will launch. It won't. I usually doesn't immediately go to the page that you want. So you're gonna have to find the iPhone page, and it's hard because iTunes is a mess. But there's a little tiny iPhone icon. Right. <laughs> Click it. You'll go to the page that shows your iPhone, and you'll see that there's a backup section and there's a. Uh, one part of the backup says encrypted backup and check that box. It's not checked by default. 
and you'll be asked for a password, use something dopey that you can remember. It's fine to use a, a, a weak password here, just so you remember it. But the point of that is the encrypted backup, only the encrypted backup backs up all your passwords, all your, all your system stuff. Otherwise, you have to re-enter that. Right, re-enter it. And, and Apple told me when I asked him about that, because that was one of my other questions I had for you, is cloning it, doing a clone. Basically, that's a clone. This is the same thing as a clone. Basically, it's a clone. Yes, and it's copying all the photos, everything. 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 Right. Yep. That's exactly... So you've answered my my third question. <laughs> Good. Can I ask you one more while I'm... While, uh, all while right, I'm, quickly, because i got a couple people waiting. Okay. Um, all of a sudden, I got... Um, uh, when I bring the uh, my Galaxy S9 into my car, it, I'm getting this message, uh, Bluetooth pairing requested. Yeah. And, um, uh, and I hit OK, and it goes... You know, the message goes away, and then... Five seconds later, I get the same message again. Do you have any idea why all of a sudden it's asking me this? Yeah. So you're seeing the message on your phone, right? On the phone, yes. Yeah. Bluetooth pairing requested, and then it gives me a six-digit code. I hit OK, and but it, but but away. you're not telling your car pair with the phone. It's just doing it. Well, it's trying to, I guess. It yeah. Can. So I think it'll go away forever if it... it <laughs> I don't know why. It, that's a little odd. Normally, the way you would get that message when you initiate Bluetooth pairing in your car. Right. So go to the settings in your car. Maybe somebody tried to initiate it and it didn't take. Go to the settings in the car. Say pair with... Cancel it on your iPhone. Go to the settings in the car. Initiate it in the car. And then watch your iPhone. And then... You should see the same six-digit number on your car screen as on your phone. When you see that, say OK on both the car screen and on the phone. And then that pairing will happen, and you won't be asked ever again. Yeah, great. And the last thing you mentioned uh, uh, a couple of hours ago in a couple of other shows, <laughs> is a camera that's on top of your car that will see all around. Yeah. It's actually on the mirrors. We didn't talk about it, but uh, this was on the Audi. What kind of car do you have? Uh, Toyota Avalon. Yeah, I don't know if Toyota does it. Oh, it's not something I. It's can not a add third on. party add-on, no. No. Okay. It comes with the car. Yeah. Uh, super, super duper. You had mentioned also. That's an app. Is that uh, for an app? Macintosh, that's a must-have backup app. Super duper. The Macintosh. Yep. Okay. We don't have a Macintosh. Well, then don't worry about it. <laughs> then don't worry. <laughs> well, all right, Leo. Leo, have a thanks, great Bob. Trip. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, anytime. It's always a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, on we go to line one. David in Anaheim, California. Hello, David. Hey, Leo. Uh, thanks so much for taking my call. Uh, Leo, I've got on my home network a couple of Windows 10 PCs, Android phone, Apple iPhone, and a couple of iPads. Okay. And... Given all the privacy concerns we're, we're all facing, uh, I'm just thinking about getting a VPN for home and was curious to see what your thoughts were on them. Yeah. And if you like the idea, if you have any you uh, won't, you Yeah, you won't like it very long. <laughs> so here's what it protects you against. Snoopy Internet Service Providers. Who's your ISP? Uh, Spectrum. So, so if you're worried that Spectrum is, and by the way, I think they are, keeping an eye on what sites you visit, and then possibly even selling that information to third parties. And you can find out by reading their privacy statement. That little tiny fine print at the bottom will tell you what, you know, what we do with the information, what information we gather, and what we do with that information. Read that. If it makes you uneasy, then the only way to really hide that is with a VPN. But remember, when you're on Facebook... You're on Google, you're on Gmail, you're on Amazon, you're on your bank. In all of those cases, the only thing the Internet service provider knows is where you're going. They know what you're doing because they can't see into an encrypted website transaction, okay. HTTPS. So they're not looking at what your bank statement says. They can't. Well, actually, that's actually strictly not true. They can if they're willing to do something that's, I guarantee you, Spectrum's not because... 
people would raise holy hell. They could, in theory, do what we call a man-in-the-middle attack. They could intercept the traffic, look at it, then pass it on. In order to do that, though, your browser, in the certificate associated with the bank, instead of saying the name of the bank, it would say Spectrum. Now, most people wouldn't see it because they don't inspect the, the certificates when they visit a secure website, but... You could do that once just to, just to verify that Spectrum is not sitting in between you. But if you look at, you know, it, it, it depends on the browser, but when you see that you're on a secure site, there, and depending on the browser, there's a way to examine the certificate, and that's what you want to do. Uh, when you examine the certificate, it, will, it has to say, uh, you know, and it's weird. In Chrome, you have to open the page. You have to... Uh, go into the um, developer tools and it's just complicated there's a tab that shows certificates but eventually you'll see the certificate it should say the name of the company you're going to not anybody else if a man in the middle attack is being perpetrated it may still say it's a secure site but the secure connection would be to your internet service provider for instance who's then passing it along to Amazon or your bank. Or okay, Google. so the, the advantage of the, of the VPN isn't so much in protecting the communication once you hit a site. It's just masking what sites you're visiting. What going sites to you're visiting. And increasingly, this is Google's big push is they call it HTTPS everywhere. They want every site to be secure. So many, most sites, our site now is secure because Google ranks you higher if you're secure. And in Chrome now, and this is going to happen soon in Safari and Microsoft's uh, browsers, it'll say you're on an insecure site. And in, in, in coming this f in a couple of months, it's going to be a red thing that says insecure. Everybody's terrified. So everybody's going to HTTPS. That's good because your, your Internet service provider can't see what you're doing. But they can see where you're going. They can always see where you're going. Even that's gotcha. a value. You know. Right. So is the main disadvantage to uh, to having a VPN, you know, whatever the cost is, and is there any... Speed and complexity, and you will no longer be appearing to come from where you're coming. You will, you will appear on the Internet at whatever the other end of the VPN is. And that means uh, you may be in, you know, Peoria, Illinois, all of a sudden, instead of Anaheim. And sometimes that's not what you want. If you're using Google Maps, it's not what you want. There's a lot of reasons you don't want to change. And there's a cost to it. So VPNs, generally I recommend VPNs only if you're out and about. Somewhere where you, but your internet spectrum, for all their flaws, and they're far from perfect, they're not going to do a man-in-the-middle attack on you because people would announce it. You would hear me scream into the heavens about it. So that's not going to happen. Now, there are, there's another way to become a little bit more private. This is kind of a black diamond tip. But okay. uh, a, a company called Cloudflare, they've been a sponsor in the past. I know them very well. I like them. Offers uh, So this is a little complicated. But the reason the Internet service provider knows where you're going, even if they don't know what you're doing, is that in order to go to Google, for instance, you have to query their domain name server, their big phone book, and say, well, I want to go to google.com. What's its IP address? And mm -hmm. they'll give you the IP address, and that's how your browser works. So that, in effect, is telling Spectrum he's going to Google. They know that. They're logging it. Uh, but there's a way around that. If you didn't use your Internet service provider's domain name system, they wouldn't see that. So, oh. so yeah. So now it's a little complicated because you have – best way to do this is in your router – if you can, log into your router and change the DNS settings. The default settings are your Internet service providers. They're, those are automatically filled in. But if you want, you can change it. And the one I would change it to is we call it Quad 1, 1.1.1.1. This is the Cloudflare service. And the entire point of this, the entire point is to hide where you're going from your Internet service provider. So now Cloudflare knows where you're going, so you have to trust Cloudflare. I do. But you're, you're transferring the trust from ISP to Cloudflare. But if you really felt like, I don't want ISP to know where I'm going, go. you can actually go on the web right now to 1.1.1.1 and read about it. And they even have information about how you would get it going. You can do it on an individual computer, but better would be to do it on a router because that will affect all the computers in your house. 
Yeah, and I know how to do that. Uh, is there any other IP setting I need to change other than nope. that one? Uh, no, nope. and you'd actually, because generally in the router it'll say uh, at least two different choices, and it's good to have two. So the first one would be 1.1.1.1. The second one would be 1.0.0.1. Again, this is all okay. documented at 1.1.1.1. Um, and, and then there's an IP6 uh, IP address you can use as well if you want to use IPv6. So okay. by doing that, you're, you're, it actually is, there's a number of benefits. It's a little faster, generally, than your ISP. Not always, but it can be. And you're, mm -hmm. and you're a little more private. Uh, Cloudflare, uh, their business is they provide services to websites to keep them from going down, to keep them from being attacked. So they've really got a lot of servers and a lot of bandwidth. They're very fast. And so they do, I think, a good job with this. They do this in partnership with the Asia Pacific Network uh, uh, Internet Center, uh, APNIC. And I think it's... Is that it's, an American, that an American service company? Uh, Cloudflare's out of the U.S. They're in Britain. Oh, okay. And it's one. the secondary DNS was 1001? Yep. Is there a charge for that, or can nope. I just put those it's, ab in? it's absolutely free. APNIC is a nonprofit. Cloudflare is a for-profit, but they have the hardware. APNIC, uh, you know, is Asia Pacific's uh, internet um, service. Uh, and so APNIC has IP address 1.1.1.1, and they worked with Cloudflare to make this possible. I think it's very interesting. I think it's a very good yeah, idea. Is it Cloudflare is an F-L-A-I-R? F L A R E like a like a oh. emergency flare. They're a good company. I like these guys. I know their CTO. As I said, <clears throat> they've been an advertiser. Uh, a lot of sites use them, uh, and this really was all about this one thing. And it's it, by the way, a VPN will slow you down, add some complexity, has other side effects. This will not. This just changes the one thing your DNS lookup. It's it's completely uh, legal and normal. To use somebody else, I also recommend OpenDNS. They do the same thing. They replace your Internet service provider's DNS service with their own. Uh, OpenDNS has some other features that I think is quite good. Just remember that now whatever company you're using has the same information that your ISP used to have. You're transferring the trust. You, the ISP no longer sees where you're going, but that other company will. In this case, no problem. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Good question. Really good question. And yeah, if you go to 1.1.1.1 on the web, that, that's actually, they will show you uh, how to do this. They'll walk you through the whole thing. Sweet. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for calling. Thank Great question. Hey, it's Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I got another call before we end up uh, the end of the hour, and that's Scott in one of the most beautiful places in the world, Whidbey Island, Washington. My, my aunt and uncle live up Ooh. there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. So Good. Greetings. Uh, I have a mid-2012 MacBook Pro that I've been very pleased with. It was my switch from Windows to Mac, and I've loved it, but it's time for me to just start shopping new. Uh, I would eventually replace this, but with all the stuff that's out there, I'm wondering, I don't necessarily need to replace it exactly, and if I did, it would be a $2,000 computer, which I don't need. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> what should I be looking at? I replaced my 2015 MacBook Pro with uh, one of the new 2018s, and I'm, I'm. I know. Uh, you've heard me. Ta you've heard the tale. Uh, I'm very happy, yeah. actually. I but it was four thousand yeah. plus dollars. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. was chokingly expensive, as apples are. So you're willing not. Yeah. <clears throat> you're willing not to have a Mac OS device. No, no, no. I want the Mac OS. I want. I want to stay in the Mac world. I'm okay. just wondering: Do I want to be looking at uh, that machine, or or the 13 inch without the Touch Bar, or is a MacBook Air going to be? Am I going to be happy if I go? All MacBook good questions. Air yeah. So the Air is their least expensive at this point, nine ninety nine. But there's a good reason for it. It hasn't been updated in years. And oh, okay. the screen is uh, the lowest quality screen Apple offers. It's not a retina display. It's the last screen Apple sells that isn't retina. And while I think it would be worth a trip, I don't know. You go, you'd have to go into Seattle, I guess, to go to the Apple store. Uh, I, would, I was thinking the same thing. And we had a MacBook Air one of our employees had. And I said, oh, I'm going to look at it. Can I? Because it's so light and thin. It was the first Ultrabook. I really like the Airs. But I looked at the screen, and I'm so used to Retina displays. 
Right. That I can't use it. It's just blurry looking to me. Now, I don't know. Is your 2012? Your 2012 may not be a retina display. It, it is not. However, I have an iPad mini that is retina. Yeah. So you'll know the difference right away. And part of it is for work. I use part of it for my, my machine for work. So it's not consumer, totally consumer. Uh, and budget, I mean, I'm just trying to be smart with my money. I don't blame you. I can't afford the $4,000 machine you yeah, bought. I, don't blame I can you. afford that. Yeah. But I don't think I need that much. It's really the issue is that is it, it, they, I have to think Apple's going to update the MacBook Air if they're going to keep it around anyway soon. This thing is way yeah. out of date. Uh, the other choice would be, the, as you said, the 13-inch without touch bar, where they call that the MacBook Escape because it has an actual escape key, but also because you escape the touch bar and that uh, keyboard yeah. and all that. And I had a MacBook Escape, and I liked it quite a bit, but <clears throat> you should be aware they did not update that in the most recent update. Right. So it's right. still, I don't know if it's... I've been waiting for the fall to see what they're doing because I earlier this spring I went, oh, I think I need, I should start shopping yeah. right now. You know, I'm not, I can buy if I want to today, but I don't need to buy. I'm not, I want to... Are you going to get a... I don't want to be under <clears> pressure. You're going to get a 13, right? Yeah, that's what I currently have. I'm very pleased with it because I 85% of my use is at home and when it's closed, clamshelled, and I have a ah. two-inch monitor. And a oh, so you don't care what the screen is. Yeah, yeah. The only time I ever see the inside of my current MacBook Pro is when I travel. And I travel frequently, but it's only two and three days at a time, a couple times a month. So, I like 13 because yeah. it's very portable. As you say, because you're using it with an external screen, the screen size on the laptop doesn't really matter. The MacBook Correct. Pros are fairly affordable. The... Uh, you know, if you're going to get the uh, the newer one, it's going to start at seventeen ninety nine. That's five hundred bucks more than the Escape that you were talking about. But you get yeah. a quad core processor, so you it's it it, it you it will absolutely be faster, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's even if a big deal to me. yeah, speed is a big deal. You're going to notice these are the eighth generation. They're uh, and they're and they're quad core as opposed to the dual core in your old machine. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> the graphics has been considerably updated, even though it's still motherboard graphics, unless you get a discrete card. It's uh, the Iris Plus graphics. That's still a lot better than the one in your 2012. You can get a choice and finally. That, if, uh, go ahead. The, well, I was, uh, are you describing what is now the base model? That yes. Comes with with the, touch bar. Uh, yes. So the, 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 the base model touch bar. Okay. This is the cheapest new macbook pro one of the macbook pros they upgraded last month so yes. so this is this is your starting point much better display that's retina with true tone which means it adjusts for ambient light i i didn't mention but apple does have an outlet store and you can always save a few yeah. hundred bucks by buying a refurbished outlet store uh, mac if you get the current model the new ones the 2018 models at the refurb store what you're going to get is something that wasn't used, <clears throat> but they can't sell as new because somebody bought it, took it home, opened it, took it out of the box, had buyer's remorse, brought it back. They can't sell it as new, but that's not been used. So those are actually pretty good deals. Right. That's worth saving the couple hundred bucks, so I would recommend that. Um, okay. I, I, the touch bar, I thought, was a silly gimmick, and I still think it's a silly gimmick. Apple really ought to do a touch screen. Everybody else in the world has. Apple won't. So they put this little second screen right above the keyboard where the function keys are. They call it the touch bar. Here's the one thing. There's a there's a $20 program called Better Touch Tool that lets you turn that touch bar into something useful. The theory was that applications would use it, but nobody's done it. The only people who have used it is Apple, and Apple's barely used it. So it hasn't lived up to its promise. You do get a fingerprint reader, which I think is worth it. And with Better Touch Tool, you can put things that are useful there, like battery life, time. Um, that you can actually, oh. yeah, you can actually use it as a a much more useful thing. So I've yeah, the time, for example, my up in my corner is of my time. I, it's what I use ninety percent of the time when I need to know what time it right. is. Right, my screen. Me too, and the date. And I can put the weather, date, and time on the touch bar. So it's really easily seen. I don't have to look for it on the screen. And if I've gone full screen, which I often do on a MacBook, 
it doesn't it's not obscured anymore i can still see weather date and time so that is customizable i keep a button there for instance because i often want to launch a finder window i don't have to dig through my folders i use full screen a lot as i mentioned so i don't have to move around to find a finder window i press the finder button on the touch bar and i get a finder window so there's some useful things touch bar touch it's the, the touch bar tool is really a good uh a purchase i i think that's made it useful uh, okay. The other thing that people uh, don't like is the keyboard, and that you know that's just a matter of taste. In my opinion, I hated the 2016 and 2017 MacBook Pro keyboards. The 2018 actually is pretty usable. They just did it. They made it yeah. to slightly better. I think we're not going to have the the crumb problems we had. So honestly, I think it'd be worth the 1800 bucks. And that's all you need. Okay. If you wanted, you could spend a couple hundred bucks more and get 16 gigs of RAM. Remember, these are all glued together. There's no upgrades possible. You get what you get. But 1800 bucks, you're going to get the 13-inch. You might want to upgrade the RAM. You might want to upgrade the storage. That's up to you. I would, if you if you can, sure. try the keyboard. It's very different from your 2012. But okay. uh, in my opinion, it's it's usable now. But this is a very personal choice. Well, and again, the most of it, I'm 80, 85% of my, 90% of my time is at home when I'm using external devices. So you don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is yeah. a massive improvement. Quad core by itself is going to give you 70% better performance on most apps. Awesome. Yeah. So awesome. I guess that would be my recommendation. And I know that you recommend Super Duper, and I'm backed up a hundred different ways. Oh, then this is easy. I don't have yeah. Super Duper. Well, um, it's, there's a free version. Thing for me to do. Yeah, it's a free yeah. version. Try it for free. Enjoy your new computer. You deserve it. You're, you've, you've been good six years. It's time. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I think you I, you owe it to yourself. Is it in, in your budget, 1800 bucks? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, and part of it is because it's work. So I have, right. I have work money allocated for And I don't think... It. I think it's a foolish economy to buy a laptop for 500 bucks. I think you're going to buy another one a year later. I have been, when I switched from Windows to Mac with my 2012 MacBook Pro, I knew that I was going to love it. Yeah. And I never looked back and there's not even a consideration no. of getting out of the Apple yeah. world. But um, it's a, I like the operating system. I really love it. And man, they make these beautifully. They're expensive partly because they're doing really good engineering on these yeah so yep. it's worth it you'll like the new trackpad for when you are uh, mobile it's giant it's the size of your iphone and uh very responsive i think they've done this is these are beautiful little computers and i think they're worth eighteen hundred dollars okay. yeah okay all right that that helps yep have Thanks. a good one bye-bye We'll have more of the tech guy in just a bit but i want to tell you about the way you're getting the tech guy if you're on a modern leading edge smartphone you probably got the qualcomm 845 processor in there that snapdragon is fast have you noticed data speeds well let me i'll give you some actual uh, data about the data speeds because <laughs> who doesn't want more speed right according to ookla they do the speedtest.net apps right uh they surveyed a million real world results from q2 2018 what's that april may june of this year and they took a look at AT&T and T-Mobile users. They found that the Android phones with the Snapdragon 845 from Qualcomm Technologies were up to 192% faster on data than non-Android phones with Intel modems. That shouldn't even be possible. But it is, thanks to the Qualcomm Snapdragon 845. 192% faster! Plus all sorts of great features. That third-generation Qualcomm Hexagon 685 DSP does the... Uh, Onboard AI processing gives you amazing images. Nowadays, in a modern phone, it's all about the DSP, the software and the and the and the processor, the digital signal processor in the phone, not the camera lens. You get better voice recognition. You get better augmented and virtual reality experiences. You get better gaming experiences thanks to the Hexagon 685. They have a built-in secure processing unit. It's engineered to help protect personal data nowadays there's so much on our phone like our fingerprints our iris scans we, we want to keep that secure that secure processing unit keeps it away from prying eyes and it really is energy efficient you if you have one of these snapdragon 845 phones you know it's engineered for all day life plus the qualcomm quick charge means you can get up to 50 percent charge in about 15 minutes so even if you're running low you know it's the end of the day you want to go out 
You just plug it in for 15 minutes while you wash your face and brush your teeth, and boom, you're back up. Check out all the data for yourself. It's at qualcom.com slash twit, Q-U-A-L-C-O-M-M.com slash twit. And then when it's time for a new phone, upgrade your data speeds with a phone powered by Snapdragon 845. That's my next phone. Qualcom.com slash twit. And we thank Qualcomm for their support. Back to the Tech Guy podcast. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography. You know, all that stuff. All the jazz, the technology, the stuff with the chips in it that we talk about on the show each week. We have a great website. I should mention this more often, techguylabs.com. Uh, I'm terrible at marketing. But uh, that has a bright side because I also don't charge you for access to this. There's no subscription. You can just go right there. It's like one of those, like that web used to be in the old days. You just don't go there. TechGuyLabs.com. Everything we talk about on the show is there. James DeRuvo, as I speak, is writing this all down, putting it up on the site. So if you hear something, you want a link, you want to know, what did Leo say? You can go there, TechGuyLabs.com, and find everything that's been on the show, including, by the way, after the show's over, audio and video from the show. Going way back, I don't know, 1,521 episodes. <laughs> That's quite a few. Back to 2004. TechGuyLabs.com. There's a good search tool there. You can search through the old stuff if you want to find out. What was the camera Leo recommended in 2006? You could find that. Um, and if you want, if you, if you disagree with something I say, which believe it or not, does happen once in a while... You can go there and leave a comment or a suggestion. Or maybe you just got one more thing. Leo forgot to mention this. That's great. TechGuyLabs.com. We appreciate your comments as well. Back to the phones online, too. David from South El Monte, California. Hello, David. Hello, Leo. Thanks so much for calling. I appreciate your hanging on. Oh, good. Uh, I had a question. Um, if I'm surfing the Internet with my browser on uh, my cell phone with 4G data, um, is that um, a method that's unhackable and similarly like on the hotspot when the hotspot is uh, WPSK? Um, yeah. Is that a cure hotspot? So nothing is unhackable. <laughs> that, that, hacking is almost always possible. Really, the question is how hard is it to hack? LTE is very secure. It's encrypted as it's flying through the air to the, uh, to the uh, cell phone tower. However, <clears throat> it's possible to, uh, to hack your phone in ways. The radio in your phone, the software running in the radio in the phone, S7, is notoriously hackable. Uh, it's also possible for somebody to spoof your SIM card. There's all sorts of ways mm -hmm. to do this. None of that's going to happen to you. It's too much work. If you were a Russian spy... Then I would tell you, please, comrade, do not use your phone for secure communications. But as long as uh, somebody pretty sophisticated isn't going after you, I think you're all right. Now, you asked about Wi-Fi. Uh, that's, that's an interesting question because for a long time we said WPA2, that's the encryption used on your Wi-Fi, is secure. Uh, turns out it's a little less secure when we th that we thought. In fact, WPA3 is on its way, and newer routers uh, will be probably software upgradable. And, of course, any router you buy after, uh, I guess, probably next year uh, will be W3A compliant, WPA3 compliant. And I would use WPA3. But let me talk about how WPA2 is hackable. It's not easily hacked. What somebody needs to do is sit on the network for a while. So uh, you're at home using your Wi-Fi router with a password login. Uh, you're using WPA2 PSK. Uh, somebody this is the hotspot on the phone, the cell phone. Same thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's two things there. The cell phone's getting its connection from LTE. We just talked about problems potentially there. Now the connection from the cell phone to the computer over the hotspot, that's encrypted using WPA2. <clears throat> if somebody can get enough of your data, they can take it home and run a brute force attack on it. And if you don't have a good password for your WPA2 connection, they can crack it. Then they can come back and get on it. 
Now, on your phone, you're moving around. So this is not likely. It's much more likely an attack somebody could sit on the curb of your house, you know, and do it because you're not going right. anywhere. Uh, it's also difficult to brute force a good password. So the new advice on WPA2 for Wi-Fi is use strong passwords, just like you do on a on your bank or anywhere else. You know, long, not five letters, six. Well, I guess you have to use eight, but but not, or I guess seven is required. Um but make it longer. Make it 12. <clears throat> Don't make it dictionary words. Make it pretty random if you can. The harder the password is to crack, the better for you. Mm -hmm. If you have a good, strong password on WPA2, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Exactly. So don't, you know, don't use monkey123. <laughs> I, you know, I'll be honest. I do use fairly weak passwords on WPA because I figure, well, nobody's going to be hacking my Wi-Fi. But now with this new attack, this is fairly new, this uh, brute force attack on WPA2, uh, there's some legitimate reasons to have a stronger password. So that's all I would do. I wouldn't worry too much about LTE. I'll put a link in the show notes uh, to a good uh, Ars Technica um, article. LTE wireless communications used by billions isn't as secure as we thought. Uh, LTE was supposed to be much more secure. Uh, and in fact, what Ars Technica says is uh, LTE is secure in the transmission, but because it doesn't, it's not. It's not that it's weak encryption. It doesn't. Uh, it's that it's uh, authentication means a hacker can perhaps impersonate you with an encrypted right. packet. So there is a. You can look it up. There's an attack called A L T E R, alter, uh, that that. It, we, in the right circumstances, can trick your LTE. I wouldn't worry about it. This is not going to happen. You're, you're pretty safe. But I will put a link in the show notes uh, to this article in case you really want to be paranoid. It's, okay. There, it literally is the case. There is nothing that's perfect. There's no perfect security. <clears throat> My friend Steve Gibson says, if you want a completely private conversation, take off all your clothes, everything, <laughs> just nothing, no, no headphones or anything, walk out, into a middle of a field, you've got to be at least a thousand meters away from any civilization, and then you can have a nice private conversation. But make sure there's no drones. <clears throat> Even then, I don't know if you're so safe, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's no such thing as perfect security. There never will be. There never is, because there's always ways and ways. I would. I feel fairly comfortable uh, using my uh, LTE device, both as a hotspot. And uh, and just surfing on the phone, I feel I don't I don't think there's anything to worry about. You're fine. You're much better off doing that, frankly, than you are going into a coffee shop, opening up your laptop, and joining their open Wi-Fi network. That's really insecure. Much better off. And this is certainly what I will do when I'm traveling. Um, you know, use use a Wi-Fi hotspot. I actually bring with me a, a little orange puck that's designed to do this. Um, and it, it, it gets the LTE signal and then is a Wi-Fi access point. And I feel that that gives us a sufficient security. I will make sure that that password is pretty pretty strong. But uh, you could do that with your phone, too, hotspotting your phone. In fact, you know, <clears throat> I will be traveling in some of, the, some of the more dangerous places of Europe. But really, the risk to me is not going to be data theft, but just pickpockets. <laughs> Barcelona, Tangier, Morocco, uh, you know. So this is, it's, 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 it's similar in this sense. Uh, if you say, can I, can I carry my wallet down the Las Ramblas in Barcelona and, make sh and be absolutely certain no one can steal my, can pick my pocket or steal my money? No. No, you can't. But there are things you can do to make it really hard like wearing a pocket with a zipper or a money belt, uh, you know, make it hard. Bad guys have a lot of incentive, and they're fairly ingenious at thinking of ways to rip you off. So it's impossible to say that you're completely safe whenever you're on a wireless communication. But I think LTE uh, and hotspots with good passwords, that's about as close as you can get. And I do have zippers in all my pockets. <laughs> and I carry a travel router with me, too. So that's another thing. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's take a little tiny time out. More of your calls coming up next. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You are 
Well, whoever you are. I'll tell you who our next caller is. It's Andy in Los Angeles. Andy, you're very patient. Thanks for hanging on. Uh, my pleasure, Leo. Uh, thank you very much for all the years of inspiration. Uh, I've definitely followed a lot of your steps. Uh, thank make you. a video podcast myself. Oh, yeah. Angeles. Good, good, good. And uh, you've been super inspiring, and I've all been following you for years. What's the topic of your uh, video podcast? Uh, it's General Lifestyle. It's called the Focus TV Network. Fun. Uh, we have about 34 shows and a live wow. morning show. Oh, you're serious. Uh, like, this is a this is a big uh, operation you got. Well, it's the baby operation to your operation. <laughs> no, that sounds pretty good. I always wanted to do a... Um, a uh, morning show. So this is FocusTVNetwork.com, is that it? Yes. Neat. America's and, first uh, streaming it, video talk show network. How's it going? Is uh, it going pretty well? It's going great. Uh, the name of the show specifically is Good Morning La La Land. That's the live morning show. Um, and because it is live, you can imagine the production challenges. That oh, I do. I know exactly operation. how hard that is. Yeah. This looks uh, really uh, nice. It looks super professional. That's great. Well, I appreciate that coming from you. Um, speaking of which, so this specific question is, relates to sound. Okay. Um, we use lobs, of course, and because we have three or four people at a time sometimes, and yeah. you know we're moving guests along pretty quickly, you know we really don't get a chance to do mic checks and leveling. So uh, we try to do some post production, and I'm having a heck of a time trying to figure out a simple way to uh, mix the audio. Or the mixer mixes the audio, but. As you know, occasionally, sometimes somebody is low, somebody's loud, somebody's low. It's so difficult. This is so challenging what you want to do. And, of course, live doubles the complexity. So I sometimes wish that I had just stayed with audio. <laughs> Radio is so much easier. Audio podcasts. But then you start doing TV, you know, video. And then, you, and then if you really want to drive yourself nuts, do it live. <laughs> So I completely understand. Now, the thing that's interesting, and then you realize very quickly when you start uh, doing this, is real TV, network television audio, is terrible. And I'll tell you, when I first hit me, I was listening to one of the, the a podcast version of one of those Sunday morning shows. I don't know, Face the Nation, Meet the Press, one of those. And I was thinking, this sounds awful. But you don't notice it when you're watching television. Because the picture is so important, uh, the way the human brain works, that you kind of don't hear the audio. Now, if you put that on a podcast that's audio only or you put it on the radio, people would say, well, that's not, that's not acceptable. So, uh. so that's one thing that you know we learned pretty quickly. I am not, and you probably have seen in some of our videos, uh, we do a video of this show. I don't use these lavalier, these little lapel mics if I can avoid it, because of exactly the problems you, you talked about. But most people who are doing TV don't want to do what I do. <laughs> in fact, real TV people, when they see what we do, they say, what are those big microphones in front of your face? And, uh, and my attitude is I want the best sound, especially for podcasts. Right. People listen more than they watch. And even in morning television, even if you ask the producers of the Today Show or Good Morning America, they'll tell you most people aren't watching. They have it on. But they're making breakfast, getting the kids ready for school. They're bopping around the house. They're listening as much as they're watching, maybe more. So all morning well, shows I, I, are essentially radio shows with pictures. Right. I heard you say on Mac Break Weekly a couple of days ago, uh, you were talking about this, and you actually pointed out uh, when he, I think Alex Lindy built that studio, and he was talking about uh, you know video versus audio, and actually recently had somebody who has more of a podcast than a video, uh, and I actually got those high mics that you have. Uh, Love them. They wanted the better sound. Love them, but you don't want to use them in uh, you know on, on uh, Good Morning La La Land because it's, oh, a yeah. it's a TV show, and people would say, well, what are, they, what are they doing? I don't mind because what we do is geeky, and the geeks understand probably, yep. and it doesn't. I don't care about presentation as much. I worked in TV too long. <laughs> I no longer care. I don't even wear makeup. So that brings me to the question. Not, well, you look good, but that brings me to the question. Uh, we do post, but fortunately, 90% of the people watch it not live. So I do have a chance of post producing. Oh, okay. Cleaning up the sound. Well, there's a couple of solutions. First of all, there's two kinds, as you probably know, of, of lapel mics there's directional and there's omnidirectional. The problem with directional is it requires some sophistication because if the mic is not positioned correctly on the, on the shirt of the lapel, it's not aiming right at the, at the mouth. 
yeah. uh, it, it'll sound terrible. On the other hand, if it is positioned properly, it'll sound much better because it won't pick up as much room noise. It won't pick up cross talk from the other people. It'll give you much more of the kind of sound we get with a professional table stand radio mic because you're talking right into the mic. So we we tried these uh, directional mics at first because the sound is better. But exactly what happened to us happened to you, which is people run on the set. You mic them up quickly. They sit down. There's no time for a check. And the thing is pointed to the left. <laughs> or they turn their head and you hear their head yeah. going back and forth. Do you remember uh, the classic Singing in the Rain, uh, which is all about... You know, the uh, the classic movie, Singing in the Rain with Gene Kelly, is all about the transition from silence to talkies. And they had the same problem. <laughs> There's a wonderful scene where she's got a microphone in the big bow on her dress, but as she's turning her head, she goes back and louder and quieter. And it's exactly the problem we're still facing 60, 70 years later. It's, it's kind of... So the question is, in software, what software can I use to mix this? Because I can raise the level on one. And there is leveling and software. Yeah. There's auto... Uh, and we actually have started to use a... Um, a actually, a really got, nice mixer you might want to look at from Behringer that does auto leveling at, on the fly. So you'll have decent uh -huh. mixing as well. Now, they used to call this Dugan... D-U-G-A-N mixing. All right. Uh, Dugan's a guy. And he, I'm sure he sent him a cease and desist letter and said, you can't call it Dugan, that's me. So Behringer uh, has, they don't call it Dugan anymore. But basically what you're looking for is Dugan mixing. And uh -huh. it's now because of computers and digital uh, DSPs, it, it's so good. See, here's the problem. What the Dugan does is what a human would do when somebody starts talking. It turns them up and turns everybody down. Right. And when somebody else talks, it turns them up and somebody down. Now, the problem is the human is slow, and so there's the first word out of their mouth yes. is going to be low, and then it's going to come up, and it's going to sound terrible. But thanks to computers and DSPs, this can happen virtually instantaneously. So uh, good software will actually do this perfectly, much better than any human can do. And we've had very good uh, uh, results with these uh, Behringers, and they're not expensive. They make a variety uh, of them. It just depends on uh, how many inputs you need. And the, right. the, the auto mixing is built, or the Dugan, as, as I will call it, uh, is built in. So uh, the X32, I think, is the one we use. I can't remember. But but look at these Behringer. I will. Multiple, you know, you can have 8 mics, 16 mics. Yep. Uh, they do a very nice job. And the Dugan... Sorry, Mr. Dugan. Mixing uh, really is exactly what you want. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. In post production. Yeah. So, you know, but this does a better true. job than you can do in post because it's doing it uh, on the fly. So your live audio will be just as good as your post. And I think it's just as good as anything any human could do in post. Hey, thanks for the question. Good luck with your uh, network, focustvnetwork.com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All right. That's good. That is. This is really. Are you ad supported? How are you doing this? We are really. We're trying to be more of like the Netflix of talk and building the content because we're really trying to keep it evergreen. You know, your stuff is very current, so you know you have to sit, get stale pretty. It's quickly. a big problem for us because you know we can't. The, our our stuff is like fish. It's no good after a few days. Yeah. So um, we actually, I almost strip out anytime anybody mentions a date of anything or anything like that. So it's really just like a it's like a perpetual sixty minutes of trying. And how to many shows are you doing? This is. Uh... We have uh, 32 shows. Holy cow. Um, You're much bigger than Twit. This is no, huge. No, 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 not even close. But uh, you, you know, it's it's basically you know it's heavily inspired by you. I'm, I'm thrilled. Over my skis, of course. But uh, I wondered. I really wondered why. I mean, we've been doing this for 12 years. Nobody has done this um, right? in other arenas. I don't want them to do it in tech, but I don't. Nobody's done this. So we have we have the XR16. Um, okay, great. John has brought it into us. Now, the drawback on this, is there a drawback on this, John? Remember there was something? No? The 16s, that's got us, that's got eight mic inputs. Oh, the 16, there's not individual tracks. If you get the 32, 18, or rather. see the levels. I need to see the I need to see the meters technically. So, so there's no meters on this, but it has a software interface, so you can use an iPad to mix it. Or a computer, okay. and all the meters are on there. And if yeah. you get the 18 or better, it will do 
ISOed audio. So you can then in post fix it a little bit if you want. Yeah, I have a Zoom that does that, that has yeah. ISOs all the audio separately. Yeah. This is inexpensive. Uh, this is fairly inexpensive. Yeah, yeah, they're great, but you, so you don't have any favorite mixing software that you can just pump it in and just pump it. Well, I use Audition. I mean, if you, but that, but okay. so Audition is really the king of the hill on this stuff. Okay, and it has leveling. It has all the leveling stuff you'd want. What I did early on was a lot of compression. Now I don't know how that'll work on TV. For audio, that's great. I mean, that's what AM radio sounds like. Everything's boom. But you may not want yeah. that sound. I don't know. It works a little bit there. Okay, I'll let you go, but thank you again. So hey, good luck on the network. I am thrilled that you're doing this because I, you, you know, it, down, it, if you ever get to Los Angeles, please, you know, I will. You do as a tr tremendous pioneer. I will don't be very Skype. interested to see this. We don't do any Skype. Uh, are you looking at linear? Uh, are linears looking at you? Yeah. What I'm what I'm really looking at is there's these DigiNets that are living in between yes. the uh, the networks. Yes, and we're aware of those. Really where yeah, we're I'm starting really to do some lim linear deals in a variety of different, uh, including these DigiNets, mm -hmm. uh, because our stuff isn't as well produced as yours is, I'm sure. But oh, uh, stop that. <laughs> your stuff is great. Well, so, we uh, we're actually on BTV bought one of our shows, so with a public nice. service. Uh, 7 a.m. show on BTV, the one that shows Gilligan's Island, you know, those kind of old-time shows. Uh, they show it on Sunday morning. So. Right on. This is, That's how long great. have you been doing this? Uh, this is two years, um, two years in the making, and uh, all our hosts are all volunteers. They all produce their own shows. They all book the talent. So that's really the amazing part of it, uh, which from a business standpoint, you can appreciate the oh, I understand. How the costs get up there. Yeah. Are you self-funding this, or did you get investors? I am self-funding. Yes, I am self-funding for now. Wow. Uh, and really just trying to build the content and, uh, you know, create that platform that's similar to what you have. Andy, um, good luck. I, I'm Thank just you. thrilled that you're doing this. Uh, and I wish you the best. I know exactly how hard this is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Good luck, Andy. It's great to hear right, from you. And I've so got I've got your address, so I'll email you when we're in town. Oh, I would love it. Thanks. My honor. All right. All right. Thanks, Leo. Take Bye -bye. care, Andy. Bye bye. There's Mr. Paul Simon, ladies and gentlemen, an indication that it has come on the Tech Guide Show. It is time mm. to talk photography. Maybe not Kodachrome, but photography with Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. Hi, Chris. Hi, Leo. Kodachrome is probably gone for good, but uh, j just as a little aside, Ektachrome is coming back right now. Oh, so well, wasn't Kodak Ektachrome, that's the, that was always a little blue, wasn't it? Ektachrome, well, it has its own kind of personality, but it's uh, it's a slide film and it was off the market, but they have, well, the re <laughs> okay. Is, <laughs> is Kodak bringing it back or? Kodak is bringing it back because they have... Um, well, they, 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 they have a Super 8 camera now. That oh, that's right. That kind of a film. And they are bringing it back in 35 wow. millimeters. So, wow. and, they, and they had to kind of re-engineer the film because they, they just couldn't get, they couldn't use certain chemicals in it these days. So they had to replace ah. some things and kind of bring it back as a new version of Ektachrome. Uh, as we record this, it's uh, it's out for beta testers, but uh, pretty soon it will be on the market, and I'm very happy about this. Chris is, of course, a digital <laughs> photography guru, but he, he likes his film cameras. He even wrote the film photography handbook, Rediscovering Photography in 35mm, medium and large format. You can get a copy of that at Amazon.com. Uh, and yeah. find out more about Chris at DiscoverTheTopFloor.com. Last <laughs> week we talked about focus, which is yeah. one of the critical... I mean, you know, we talk about photography, it's an art, but in, you can't really practice the art of photography until you learn the technique, the, the technical aspects of photography, because you've got to know how to make a good image, a, a, a in focus, well-lit image, before you can practice the art of photography, I would right. say, right? I, I just, just a few days ago, I received uh, a, a question by a listener who uh, wondered if if upgrading from his... 700 uh, D700 Nikon DSLR uh, to uh, Sony A7R3. If that would make his photos any better, didn't help me at all. <laughs> well, he, he thought he, he thought okay, this is very complicated with the DSLR because it does require you have to put some time and you have to put some learning in. It doesn't do as much automatic yeah. as a smartphone yeah. does for you. And uh, you just just upgrading to a bigger camera. Is, you're setting yourself up for for disappointment because it is not going to make you a better photographer. You are you are ninety percent of the fo uh, fo photo, ten percent of the photo is the camera, so it won't really make you 
that much better. It might be a cool toy to play with, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it will not uh, make you a better photographer. You have to learn a few things. Yeah. And we started that uh, theme last week where we talked about um, manual focus versus autofocus. It's one of these automated systems that takes some decisions out of your hand and usually does a good job. I'd say 90% of the photos are uh, come out as intended when you use these automated systems. But then there's this uh, this type of photo where the, the camera will get it wrong, where the camera won't won't do the right thing. And one area where that's the case is exposure, is how bright does the image come out? And normally it does that automatically, right? The camera will just sense what's going on in front of it. If you're out in snow, it will definitely be a different exposure than when you are inside a room and it's kind of dark. So when, what does the camera do? Let's first look at what the camera does there. Um, the camera has a few things that it can adjust and it's pretty basic. Nothing has changed since the, the, the dawn of photography. It's, um, it's, the shutter speed, how long does it let light on the sensor? It's the aperture, how big is that hole in the lens that leaves the light in? And the third is the sensitivity of the sensor. In, in the early days, that was a different kind of film, more sensitive film, higher ISO. But um, now in, on a sensor, you can pretty much just switch that over to a different sensitivity. And these three parameters make the exposure. So the camera kind of has to first look out what is there. Is it bright? Is it dark? Do I have to adjust? And then it'll adjust the these three parameters or maybe just one or two of them and give you a well-balanced picture that is not too bright or not too dark. That is the theory, right? But in extreme cases, the camera will get that wrong. Uh, let's say you have a picture in snow and most people who have shot in snow know that pictures in snow tend to come out well, I'd say with a bit of a gray tint, right? They are not as bright as you would expect them to be. And that is because the camera sees all that bright and says, yeah, I want this somewhere in the middle. So it pulls it down. Uh, on the other hand, you're taking a picture of people on stage. They, they sit, let's say a podium on stage, typically black curtain in the back. You take a picture, lots of black in the photos. So the camera sees a lot of dark. It'll try to boost the exposure, make it brighter, and then you end up with a grayish curtain and overexposed faces. Doesn't look nice. So no. that's where you kind of want to take over in these extreme situations when there's a lot of bright or a lot of dark in the picture. And you can do this. You can switch over to manual exposure. Now, this segment that we are recording here is a bit too short to explain how to really do this, but there's one tool that every camera has nowadays and uh, it's called exposure compensation. It's kind of a little dial or way to change the exposure. The camera sees snow, it goes too dark, you end up with gray photos. Now you can either in post-processing when you have the pictures on your computer uh, change something or if it's on your smartphone, there's, a, there's an editor on there to do this. Or you can do this while shooting. You can tell the camera, okay, boost it a bit or reduce it a bit and that's that's pretty much all you'll have to do to get to that point where where it kind of looks natural on the photo again takes a bit of exercise but uh, it's certainly something that you can uh, that, that you might want to look in in the manual of your camera for because every camera is kind of different there um, it's normally very easy on smartphones if you have a smartphone you point it in a direction and you end up seeing that on display that that snow is way too gray uh, with an iPhone, it's there's this this yellow box. I think it's yellow, and it has that that it shows you where where it focuses, and then it has a little sun icon next to it. You can just tap on that and then slide it up or down to brighten or oh. darken the photos. You can correct that. You can do something about that. Is you're that not exposure, you're not at the mercy of your camera. It's called exposure compensation. Is that what that is? It's called exposure. That's the official term, exposure compensation. The the symbol on your camera would be a little square with a diagonal through it and above the diagonal is a plus sign and below oh, it is yeah. a minus sign. Oh yeah. Okay. Or look That's in your manual you look and look for exposure compensation to see what it's what it looks like with some cameras you'll have to press a button and turn a dial with some cameras you just turn a dial it really depends on uh on your camera most cameras have it though right even oh, point most, and shoot yeah 
Yeah, yeah e- even point and shoots usually have a way to compensate for for when the camera doesn't get the exposure quite right. Because it happens. It does, yeah. It happens. So you've talked now about focus and exposure. Those really are the two big technical topics. If it, if a picture isn't in focus, and, and there's different reasons it's not in focus, maybe because it didn't focus right, but also maybe the object was moving, or you were moving, and you get what they call motion blur. So I, I look for a really crisp image in all four corners, in the center, everywhere. That's focus. And then today we talked about exposure, and that's a little trickier because that's almost an artistic choice. You don't want it gray is. snow, but you do want, sometimes you want it very contrasty or bright, Sometimes you you want it dark. That's but you can usually shift the focus, can't you? In, in post production, in the focus. The, is I hard. mean the exposure, the exposure not the focus. Right. Yeah. yeah, the exposure. Yeah, kind of depends on camera. And there's one more that we'll talk in a future episode, and that's the automatic the automatic colors in your color photo because cameras tend to get colors wrong as well ah. sometimes. See, this is why we love Chris. If you would love to go on a Workshop. I know I would with this guy. Go to discoverthetopfloor.com. He leads work, photographic workshops all over the world, all year long. Are you going to come to uh, the U.S.? You did last summer, not this summer. Are you going to come next uh, summer, you think? I'm working on stuff that I can't really talk about just mm-hmm. yet. Discoverthetopfloor.com. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Chris Markart. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Leo Le- He's so secretive. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am Leo Laporte, the uh, tech guy. We go on... With the show, uh, line three is Jean in North Hollywood. Hi, Jean. Hi, Leo. Thanks for your patience. I know you've been on hold forever. I'm just glad to be able to talk to you again. I wrote down everything, so let me start. I have DSL internet. I have probably the only person left in North America that still has a landline phone, AT&T. And I have a TV that I've had for several years that has a Roku adapter. Last time I spoke to you, you said to get a... Uh, router, and I have the information that I kept. Right. Um, I remember that. I wanna, right. I want to make sure, at least try to be close to making sure, that when I get this router, which you said was TP-Link Archer C8, yep. will I be able to, number one, get rid of AT&T, say goodbye to them, and use my UMA, and also... Uh, be able to use the Roku adapter that came with the TV, will I be able to do that too? Yes, yes, all of that. Now, let me tell you the caveats, though, on dumping AT&T, which may not be a big deal for you at all, but it's something you'll be aware, want to be aware of. And Uma's already told you this. Uma is a voice over internet service. It's very good. A lot of people love it. Uh, O-O-M-A. Um, they'll, they've said this already. You've seen it, but maybe you've ignored it. I just want to remind you. With a phone line, a landline, as you have, you have real nine one one. If you get, a, if you have a heart attack, if you, if there's an emergency, you dial nine one one. The nine one one operator knows exactly where you are. That's part of the real nine one one service, and they can dispatch even if you say nothing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, in an, you know, some you have a heart attack, you can't speak, but you can dial nine one one. They will dispatch an ambulance, and that's because they know where you are, even though they, you haven't told them. With voice over the internet, mm-mm, there's no emergency services, no 911. So now you can call on a cell phone, and I pres- do you have a cell phone too? I'm going to get one very shortly. So you can call 911 on a cell phone. You can't do it. I don't know. Uma may have 911 now, but you should check. Some voice over internet services do, some do not. The cell phones all do, they're required to, but they tend to have something called E911. E911 is not as good as the real 911 because even though the cell phone does know where you are, they 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 don't have that information most of the time the operators don't have that information. So when you call 911 on a cell phone, you'll be calling a regional uh, cell phone service, not uh, 911 service, not the local, you know, one in your town. Right. And so response times are a little slower. Sometimes a lot slower. So that's something to be aware of is E911. Actually, Scooter X has given me a link to Uma's page on 911 services. So let me just check. Uh, good. Okay, this is good news. Uma does offer 911. And what the 911 info will be whatever registered address you're using with Uma. So if you use Uma with your physical address mm-hmm. and you dial 911, 
they will have your location. Okay? So okay. that th they'll have the location you gave them. But there's another drawback. If the internet goes out or your power goes out, you won't have 911. Oh, so I should, yeah. Well, like I said, I'm hopefully getting... Uh, a cell phone helps cell with phone. that, right. Yeah, before they... And then, and then the FCC, the good news is we're making some real progress with cell phones because most cell phones do know exactly where you are within 10 feet because right. of GPS. And the FCC has moved along this process, and I think it's really probably complete in a lot of areas, almost certainly in, in L.A. area, that the 911 service is there will get your GPS location or, you know, a pretty good location on you automatically. Right. So that's being fixed. Okay. Okay. There's S nothing else that I need to buy outside of this router because, like I said, I don't know anything about uh, electricity. No, I think you'll be set up. The UMA will use your internet through the router. <clears throat> Sometimes an UMA, if you look at the UMA setup, they'll say, well, we would rather be connected direct to the internet and then you connect the router to us. That gives them a little more control over some things. It's up to you. You can do it either way. You read the UMA instructions once you get the router about how they want to be set up. Okay. Because when I did this years ago, when I first got the UMA, of course, I didn't know anything about a router. And I connected it, turned off the AT&T or unplugged it, and everything went out. Yeah. The internet, the phone, everything. Yeah. Well, this will be better. We've come a long yeah. way, baby. Okay. <laughs> and and this then your Roku, your router... Um, you're going to get, uh, I can't remember if the Archer C8 is Wi-Fi. I'm pretty sure it is, right? It's a, you're going to get, a, you want to get a Wi-Fi. Yeah, it is Wi-Fi. So what that means is you'll have wireless internet. You'll have wired and wireless. You'd want to use wired for the UMA. So put the UMA near the router and plug it in via an Ethernet cable. But okay. the Roku could be anywhere in your house that you can get the Wi-Fi. And the Roku has built-in Wi-Fi. So you'll have to go into the Roku settings and enter in the name because you're going when you get your router you're going to name it and don't you i would not use your address okay i use dead rock stars okay <laughs> you could use constellations anything that you'll recognize but that won't usually you don't want to say uh this is gene's router and gene's address is this you don't want to say that right you, and you don't want to use the name of the manufacturer either because that Anybody sitting on the street, well, you're give, you're leaking information. You don't want to leak any information, so oh. just use something generic. Name it the tech guy. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> and I don't need a router that's any more updated than the one that you gave. No, this is a good one. Okay. And TP Link does keep this up to date. So yeah, all the things I talk about keeping your router up to date, this one is a good one for that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So you're going to name your router. Say you call it the tech guy. Give it a password. Turn on WPA2 encryption. Uh -huh. So no one can use your Wi-Fi. You don't want anybody. You don't want your neighbors using your Wi-Fi, and okay. and give it a password. Give it a good password, one you can remember, but one that's strong. Right. Because lately, I'm sad to say, we've heard about problems with Wi-Fi security. WPA two, if you have a, you know, if your password is monkey one two three, can be cracked. Right. So give it a good password, like you would use on a on your bank website. Something you remember. You only need to enter it once anyway. Okay. You'll enter that into the Roku. It'll see the Wi-Fi, and then the Roku will be online, and you'll be good. Oh, great. Have a wonderful vacation. We're going to miss you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I will miss you, Gene. Thank you. Take care. Nice to talk to you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, uh, I was talking about router setup. This is really important. You want to use, if you're using a Wi-Fi router, you don't want anybody using it. You don't want your neighbor using it. Uh, you know, I used to, in the old days, you'd set up a router and uh, you'd make it open. You wouldn't encrypt it. You'd make it open. Then somebody comes along and they can use it. Too dangerous to do that these days. Sorry. So when you set up your router, give it a name that you remember. There's a few things. In fact, let me give you this, the whole routine. I can do it in a nutshell. So the first thing you do when you get a brand new router, you plug it in. You're going to uh, look in the manual and you're going to see the way you configure this router is you uh, plug it in and you plug a computer into it or you set up a computer to connect to it and you use your browser to surf to a special address, the address of the router. Usually it's something like 192.168.1.1 or 10.0.0.1, something like that. It usually begins with a 10 or a 192. You surf to that number and, ooh, there's the browser. In the manual, it says, it says what the default login is admin admin something like that 
log in, and the very first thing you do now is you change the login because every router comes with a login that's the standard login that everybody knows. It's in the manual. So the first thing you do is you give it a new password because you don't want somebody on the street to log into your router and change settings. So you give it a new password. You write that down or you put it in your last pass or your password vault or whatever, but you know, give it a good one and, and keep track of it. You'll need that if you want to ever change the settings. Next thing you do is you turn on Wi-Fi encryption, WPA2 encryption, and you give it a good long password. Long's important. Bad passwords are a bad idea, even now on routers, sad to say. Then finally, you turn, on, you turn off universal plug and play, turn off LAN administration, and you're good to go. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, man, I had to jump up and down the other day when I heard we're moving to Slack, kids. Yay! We used Slack uh, when we were working on our new website, and I just loved it. It was attractive. It was easy to use. It's much better than email for keeping in touch with a team. If they have questions, instead of calling us or emailing us, they put it on Slack, and I can either respond right away if I'm on Slack, which I often am because it's on my iPhone, it's on my Android phone, but also, you can set things like uh, off hours in Slack. I think this is really important. You can tell Slack, nope, uh, don't, no messages between 7 p.m. and uh, 8 a.m., something like that. This is my, my downtime, man. And it respects that. And then the minute it's 8 a.m. and you're up and you're ready to go, those messages come in. You can respond to them. There's lots of really nice features. Slack is very thoughtful. No, And really, it's not a surprise they're doing so well. They are the number one way people collaborate at work now slack connects all the tools and services we need in one place uh, including google drive including atlassian's jira and confluence we use those panopta if you use salesforce or zendesk all of that just part of the slack workflow so every all the information you need is at your fingertips easy to find easy to organize real-time messaging real-time video voice calls group file sharing searchable archives with Slack, your team is better connected. And I'm just really pleased that finally I can use what I really want, Slack. Go to slack.com to learn more. And maybe you can convince your boss. You know, boss, look at this. It's great, Slack. All the cool kids are using it. They really are. Every company I know now uses Slack. And I'm really glad we do too. Slack.com to find out more. Now back to the show. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. We're going to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches. But this segment's going to be a little bit different. For the last few weeks, we've been talking with my buddy Adam Fisher. He's the author of a book called Valley of Genius that is a series of interviews with some of the biggest names in technology about the history of Silicon Valley. And I wanted to play some of these recordings. He's got more than 200 interviews. This one's with Sean Parker. Who is Sean Parker, Adam Fisher? Sean Parker is the co-founder of Napster, which, if you don't remember it, was the first time that music became free. And then that collapsed in a giant ball of flames. And he was the guy who then found uh, Mark Zuckerberg and helped him create Facebook. Was Mark was like 18, 19 years old. He was kind of in the bro house in, in, in San Jose, coding on Facebook. This is, of course, in the movie, that great quote. You know what's cool? Not a million dollars. You know what's cool? A billion dollars. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, Sean Parker ever said that, but he became the first president of Facebook. Yeah, he was the one who kind of uh, showed um, Zuck the way. And Zuck wasn't even aware that uh, companies like Napster were businesses before he met Parker. So let's start with Napster. Sean Parker and Sean Fanning, two young dropouts who decided music wants to be free. Exactly. I mean, Fanning was uh, in his dorm room up in Boston, and and Parker was down, I think, in Virginia. He was actually working for Mark Pink, uh, Pincus, the oh, really? future founder oh, of Zynga, as an intern. And anyway, he he's on IRC, which is this early chat program, and discovers this early kind of um, music trading software that uh, and he, and he decides he's going to be the business guy. Now he's like twenty. 
<laughs> you knows know. nothing. <laughs> knows nothing. And and the other Sean, Sean Fanning, is similar. Like you know, 18, he's the coder. 19. Sean Fanning. He wrote the code. Exactly. So we have this classic coder kind of f- marketer duo, and they they get some money and move to Silicon Valley. Sean Fanning and I met in the underground. You know, we're living in suburbia. Um, interested in computer science, part of the computer underground, hanging out with a lot of people online who shared our interests. Prior to the release of Napster, prior to that pivotal moment, the web was totally one way. It was a client-server model. You uh, accessed information that was stored on the server. It was one-way directional communication, which was very much uh, a broadcast model where you know, individuals passively consumed what, what um, you know, what had been published and they had, they had no opportunity to interact and it wasn't a two-way street. Whereas the moment Napster launched, you were fully utilizing the capabilities of the internet. Everybody was sharing content. Everything's interactive. Napster was, was in some sense way ahead of its time. But I think there was a big difference in the perspective that, for instance, Sean Fanning had about the company, where he believed, like, fundamentally that the company would be successful and that um, we would ink deals with the record labels that would advance the music industry and prevent its certain destruction. And we were trying to make these arguments in 1999 uh, to, to record labels who were, at the time, mapping out the most complex digital rights management systems you could ever imagine that involved, you know, renting music for a minute and then returning it and, and you know, like, like a song only being able to live on one device and if you put it on another device, it would, that device would, all, it was just these incredibly complex, you know, systems that it seemed like we were, we were in a ne- never-ending conversation with their technology people about how to create a perfect system that w- where no piracy could take place. And meanwhile, while these unbelievably academic conversations are taking place, like Rome is burning, and, you know, and the, and the, or, the, or like, you know, the barbarians are at the gate, and it's over. There's some truth to the idea that this was much less of a company and more of a revolution that despite the, all the potential liability, nobody had, nobody was in, in a position where they had, had really anything to lose. I think half the company bought into the idea that this could be a very successful company. And the other half of the company, I think, was more realistic in, 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 in their understanding that this was a, a cultural revolution, it was a social revolution. There was so little greed on the part of the people who worked at the company, you know, we would have given the company to the record labels. Like, you can have it, just run it. And we could have, we executed a seamless and orderly transition to a future where, you know, artists and labels and publishers all would have been paid. Because we had every user all in one place. We, we made the argument to the record labels. I made this argument to the heads of every, every record label that was willing to listen. They didn't listen to us. So Napster ends, it folds. Uh, Parker, what what is he doing after Napster? Just floating around? Yeah, Parker's essentially broke, and he moves into kind of a group house with some Stanford students uh, and is kind of casting around for his next act. And he sees, just as the movie kind of showed, the social network, he sees this kind of copy of MySpace, but for college kids. So, So there's this weird interim period um, kind of leading up to Facebook where there was a feeling in, you know, after the dot-com bust that everything that there was to be done with the internet had already been done. And it was a complicated time because MySpace had very quickly taken over the network, uh, taken over the world from Friendster. I mean, they'd, 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 they'd seized the mantle. So, so Friendster was, in, was declining, MySpace was ascending, and the girlfriend of one of my roommates was using the product, and I was like, you know, that looks a lot like Friendster. She's like, oh, 
or MySpace, I think would have been the reference. She's like, oh yeah, yeah, well nobody in college uses MySpace. And I knew that. So I see this thing and I, I think I you know, emailed some email address at Facebook and, and I basically said, well, you know, I've been working with Friendster for a while, you know, they're not doing so well. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd just like to meet you guys and see if maybe um, there's anything to talk about. You know, so Eduardo writes back and we set up this meeting in New York. And I spent, you know, I, I don't think I said more than five words to Eduardo. Mark and I just started talking about product design and what I thought the product needed. And, and so, so, so I, don't, I don't even know what happened from there other than that, um, you know, it just became very convenient for me to go swing by the house. It wasn't even a particularly formal relationship. It wasn't even a company. Sean Parker, the founder of Napster and one of the first investors and president of Facebook. The book uh, is Valley of Genius, The Uncensored History of Silicon Valley. Adam Fisher, its author. Thank you for joining us, Adam. Uh, I think we're going to have some more segments from this because I love hearing these uh, tapes. Uh, meanwhile, back to the phones we go in just a minute. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You know who you are. Well, I can tell you. I have it written down. You are Max in Fullerton, California. Hi, Max. Thanks for holding on. Hey, Leo. Thank you so much for taking the call. Oh, I'm so glad you called. Uh, yeah. Well, we have been uh, not looking forward to a move uh, that we moved houses this weekend, uh, except for one part. We are looking forward to, my wife and I are in our mid-50s, so we have paid a cable television bill for 35 years, oh. and we have been looking forward to getting rid of that and becoming cord cutters. Cord cutters. You're sticking it to the man. We are. The and man's been sticking it to you for 35 years. It's only fair. <laughs> Probably 35 years ago, your cable bill was around $35. Today, the average cable bill is close to $200 a month. We're, we'll just say we're average people then. Yep. So, and anyway, so we went out, did some research. Uh, few, at Prime Day, we bought a couple of fire sticks and an Echo Plus. I talked with my kids who are adults and nephews and nieces that are adults about, you know, should we do Hulu TV? We wanted one, at least some live channels as well. And so we decided, uh, based on their feedback, we signed up for a YouTube TV. That's the one I pay yeah. for. I really like YouTube TV. Well, I thought I was going to like it, too. So we moved yesterday, last night, decompressing from all of that and kind of playing with the tech and having fun. I enjoy it. And come to find out, at the Amazon Fire Stick thing, which does a great job, hooked it up with Netflix right I away. Where, I know where you're going with this one. And it did a great job playing Amazon videos, which honestly, yeah. I've, never, I've been a Prime member for years, but I've never yeah. watched any of them. That was fun. And yeah. now I try to connect it to YouTube TV, my one option now for live TV, and it does not work. So, Leo, help me out. Here's what the I problem. Think? Amazon and Google are like oil and vinegar. They don't mix. And, uh, that's the real problem. Amazon hates Google. Amazon, if you search for a Google Home device, will give you an Amazon Echo instead. So they, whether it's Google not making YouTube TV available on the Fire Stick or Amazon preventing it, for whatever reason, who knows, it isn't part of the Fire Stick lineup. Um, there are plenty of other ways to get YouTube TV. I use a Roku. It works on there. It works on Apple TV as well. Uh, and so does Amazon Prime, by the way, on both of those. So I have never been a super fan of the Fire Sticks. Uh, I've, the, my biggest problem with them is Amazon really uses it to market Amazon. So you, all the highlights are Amazon Prime shows and stuff. And if you really live in that ecosystem, it's okay. But my fav Now, tell me about your TV. Is it a, is it a 4K TV? Uh, it's not. It's a it's a high def TV. It's about three years old. It's a Samsung. Okay. Um, it it does have some built in apps, but it it doesn't uh, it doesn't it has a YouTube app, but it doesn't have a YouTube TV. App. No, I know, and that's uh, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, it may at time. Uh, I would look at uh, a Roku box. You can get a new Roku box for under a hundred bucks. Am the Apple TVs are a little more expensive, and I only recommend an Apple TV if you actually buy stuff on Apple's iTunes store. Because Roku will do everything an Apple TV will do except for that. 
So Roku's half the price. It's very much like a Fire Stick. It has all the channels. In fact, it has more channels than any other device. They make a stick. I'm not crazy about sticks. So this, the idea of the stick is great. It plugs into your HDMI port, so it's invisible. It's, it just kind of smartens a TV. But putting all of that electronics in a small package like the stick, I don't know if you've noticed it, but your stick gets very hot. And in general, I find that to be a, a problem in reliability terms. They, cra they seem to reboot and crash periodically. I think that's because of the heat. And, of course, heat is in the long run going to wear that thing out. So I, I like getting a little Roku box instead. Well, Leo, I did do some looking online and noticed that a big box store down the street here, they, have, they sell all kinds of TVs, and a number of their smart TVs are, they call them Roku TVs. Yeah. If I go buy one of those, is it kind of all built in one? It I is. It's not as desirable. I got my mom a TCL, which is one of the Roku TVs, because it's easy for her. She doesn't have to worry about a Roku box. But you don't really need a new, t maybe, no, maybe this is your excuse to get one. You don't really need a new TV. Uh, I don't like smart TVs because they aren't typically updated uh and and they're sometimes less reliable and funkier to use on the other hand there's one remote uh and so you know you might prefer it there's no external box roku tv is fine it is the same thing as a roku external roku box and tcl phillips insignia that's probably what you're seeing at the big box store uh sharp Hitachi, Hisense, they all make Roku TVs. It's better than getting, like I did, getting, for instance, LG's smart TV or a Samsung smart TV with their own software because that's terrible software. At least the Roku software is made by Roku. So that's that's fine. But you don't need to get a new TV. You could get a, uh, you'd need to get an up-to-date Roku uh, device because older Roku devices do not support YouTube TV. So make sure that YouTube TV is supported on that smart TV. And if not, then, you know, just get one of the more modern Roku devices uh, and hook it up to your TV via the HDMI port, and you will get YouTube TV. It's <laughs> I've actually watched, I have YouTube TV, but I also have a cable subscription, and uh, when the cable was down, I just watched Roku TV. It was great. <laughs> Never missed a thing. It's got built-in, to, I mean, to YouTube TV, it's got built-in DVR. You can have five different users or six different users. Each can have their own built-in DVR. It gets live locals in most markets. I take it Fullerton's one of them. You probably get the L.A. stations, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah KTLA, Rich yeah. DeMuro, yeah. So uh, I, that's a good choice. And since you're a Prime customer, yes, Amazon Prime TV is on there as well. Excellent. Leo, thank you for your help. You're welcome. Yeah, I got my mom the TCL with Roku because that's great for mom. One remote. She loves Netflix. It's got a Netflix button on the remote. I mean, you could that couldn't be better for her, right? And because it's not the company's smart TV software, these television company. Look, in general, don't get software from a company that's business is not software. <laughs> TV manufacturers, their business is not software. And the software they use is usually uniformly terrible, doesn't get it updated, it's awful. Uh, somebody in the chat room is mentioning my favorite box, but it's very expensive. It's $300. That's the NVIDIA Shield. It also does a YouTube TV. It's an Android TV device. It's a kind of a, not a mainstream device because of the price. It's got a very fast NVIDIA processor in it. And as a result, you can play games on it. You can do a lot of fun things with it. Um, but I, it's hard to recommend. Oh, look, the Shield has gone down in price. Now $179. So that's actually less than an Apple TV. I like the Apple TV. I use an Apple TV because I do buy movies at iTunes. Here's a little pro tip. If you buy movies from Google, Amazon, iTunes, sign up for Movies Anywhere. It used to be Disney Movies Anywhere. And it's free. And what Movies Anywhere does is it collects all the movies from all these different places and puts them in one spot. Now with Microsoft movies, too, by the way. And so you can see all of the movies you buy on iTunes on your Google and vice versa. That makes these boxes, I think, a lot more a lot more usable for movies anyway. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's take a little break. And uh, we'll be back with more right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We go back to the phones line to Brian in Marino Valley, California. Hi, Brian. Uh, good Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good day. You know, it's five o'clock somewhere. Yes, sir. 
You're my last resort. Uh oh. I own or I have two eight, um, Apple TVs uh, okay. that stream my music from two different computers. Oh, that's what you use the Apple TVs for? Just music, huh? Well, no, I do watch. I can. I use it in addition to the yeah. app that's on but my But you use television. AirPlay from your computer or your phone to put music through those speakers, too. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, to my home theater. Yeah. Your best, so, the best speakers in the house, probably. Yes. And so uh, lately, about the, I don't know, the last, I don't know, 10 months, when I go to play back, when I select an album and I play the first song, it plays it. No yeah. problem. Yeah. Then when it gets to the second song, usually it will stall the first two to three seconds. Yeah. And will not go until I do something. In other words, hit the the remote button again or flip to the next song or... You pound on it. Yeah, like, you know... Like um, the Fonzie did to the jukebox. Uh, and it starts playing. I, I have contacted Apple. And they... Their response was that... It's your fault. It's my fault. The, the <laughs> library has gotten... No. Um, so let me ask you a couple of things. First of all, you're playing it back through iTunes? Yes. Yes. And it doesn't do this if you're listening to the computer speakers. It doesn't do this. Correct. So it, Apple's wrong. It has nothing to do with your library, I don't think, because if it did, it would do it when you're playing locally. Uh, right? Correct. Yeah. Now, I it, thought that. Yeah. I'm, I thought after all of this troubleshooting, the common denominator was my router. That's what I would say. My my, my uh, Ethernet or something. Yeah, it's the why it's the network. Now uh, here's here's where Apple could be right. You know, I mean, it, it's playing it back in iTunes locally. Uh, all it does is it loads the song in, and, and 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 you know, it actually loads most of the song, if not all of the song. You allow a lot of RAM and plays it. And then uh, as the first song is playing, the second one, it loads it all into RAM and it just keeps playing. There's no, there's no slowdown or delay because it's all just playing it out of memory. It may be that the way AirPlay works is different from, from the local, you know, from the computer's point of view as well. It may be, and I don't know this, I, this, is, this is an interesting question, be worth a little research, because you're using this AirPlay technology. It may be AirPlay says, well, I don't want to use too much local system RAM, for instance, I don't want to buffer too much those songs, so I need to just load it as we go. Well, when I look at the progress bar, well, you, you know, when I'm, I, I look at it on the screen on the television, and if the progress bar pops up, and it usually does when it right. stalls, right? I can see it. It looks like it's buffering. You see the little pinwheel. Yeah, that's what be my guess. Yeah, and then you can see the progress go out, and you can see where it's loaded. And then it gets about halfway of loading, and you can see that's where it just, you can leave it there for 20 minutes. It isn't going to go nowhere. It yeah. doesn't, doesn't matter how much time it takes. There's, there's a couple of things and, I would check. And one thing other, too. When you say AirPlay, I'm not sure if I'm using AirPlay. I mean, I, I, have, I, have it, I have it connected directly to the Ethernet, oh. at least in my movie room. And in my living room, I have it doing, what do you call it, wireless. So Okay, but when you want to play something from your computer, you're playing it into the Apple TV, right? When, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I, I suppose that's what you would call well, it. Well, I don't know. I mean, you can physically... What is the Ethernet cable coming from your computer connected to? To my router. Actually, to a switch, and no, then no, no, goes, but but it, but you said you're Etherneted to the computer, and, the, and then it goes off into the computers. So, uh, and there's two different computers. But, but the can, but the TV, it, the TV, the home stereo is not in any way hardwired to the network. No, I'm not. I don't have any computers okay. directly okay. connected. So it doesn't to matter my, how uh, it doesn't matter how the computer is connected to the internet. What matters is how the computer is talking to the TV, and it's talking wirelessly to the TV, right? Yeah, because the TV's not wired to anything. I mean, the stereo, you know, the home theater. The home theater is is not. No. It, right. So that's wireless. So, so, yeah, it is connected to the uh, eight, uh, to the Apple TV. Yeah. And the Apple TV, obviously, through. So the Apple TV 
has Wi-Fi. It's connected to the Wi-Fi network. So is your computer. The way AirPlay works is it looks at the whole network and says, are there any Apple devices on this network? Oh, I see Apple TV 1 and Apple TV 2. You have two, right? Yes. One's named Kitchen, one's named Den or whatever. Yes. And yeah. then when you want to play music from your computer to the Den, how do you tell it to play in the Den? There's a little drop down, right? Simply go to the you know to the front page on on Apple TV, and I select computers. Ah, oh, in okay. computer it'll yeah. say that's it'll a, show me which that's libraries. Airplay. That's AirPlay. So just so you know for future reference, okay, this is AirPlay, and what you're doing at this point is troubleshooting AirPlay. So uh, there are issues. Look, AirPlay is pretty amazing. But it's based on an older technology that all PCs support, most PCs support, called DLNA. And when I say that, some uh, some uh, Windows users are getting getting a little nervous because they go, oh, that's hard. DLNA, oh, that's terrible. So Apple, as is often the case, took an existing standard and said, we can make this better, and they called it AirPlay. Oh, okay. And uh, AirPlay is... Um, an interesting technique. <laughs> so there are things that can go wrong. For instance, um, you have to make sure that nothing else is connected to that AirPlay device. Right? So make sure you said that you have two Air Apple TVs. Do you play from two different places sometimes? I'm not quite sure. I mean... Okay. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. One of the things that can sometimes go wrong is your own router can be making uh, problems with the stream by not supporting all the ports that AirPlay needs. Sometimes routers, the part of their job is to protect you, um, to protect uh, you against you know foul play. And so AirPlay actually has to use a special port on the router. Let me just see which ports uh, AirPlay uses, because it may be that that port has to be unblocked on your router. Um, in other words, this is a this. Is, it, what's oh yeah, it's no, it's using port eighty, so that's a standard port. This is this is the point is that what seems what Apple makes seem very simple and transparent is actually fairly challenging. Oh, it does use the real time streaming port which is 554. Oh, it does use the digital audio access protocol, which is 3689. Oh, it does use multicast, which is 5353. My goodness, it uses a lot of ports. Mm -hmm. So it may be that your router is uh, not intentionally blocking some of those key ports. So that's another thing to look at. You want to definitely use the latest version of... Uh, iTunes and make sure your Apple TV is up to date, which they are. And these are these are the latest 4K models. Good. And then and finally, the just big... replaced the router modem router. And the biggest is problem iPhone. is really just Wi-Fi. Yes. And well, Wi-Fi yeah. has a very nasty feature, which is I think the real problem here. Well, would it still be Wi-Fi if I'm? using an Ethernet cable from the router yeah. directly to... Yeah, how's the TV connected? The television... How does the stereo system... I asked you this already. It's connected through the air, right? No, 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 no. Um, the, the, so, so the Ethernet goes to the back of the ATV. The oh, both are Ethernet. Audio out. Both are Ethernet. Yep. Okay. Ethan, if, so the... So the, uh, the eight I, gotta, eight I have to take a break. Hang on. I have to take a break. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, okay, so I, 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 I'd asked you, but I thought that the home theater system was not physically connected to the network. You say the Apple TV is wired. So, so the Apple TV is wired, and then the Apple TV, I'm using audio out to a audio in. On I don't care the, about that. On the receiver. Yeah, I don't really care about that. Um that's interesting. Okay, so you are your Apple TV is wired and your computer is wired to the router. There's no Wi-Fi involved in this at all. In this particular one for my movie room, correct. It's hardwired all the way. I wanted no, no, what do you call it? No modems or no wireless problems. Yeah, because Wi-Fi, this dropout thing is exactly the kind of thing that happens with Wi-Fi. And the thing is, Leo, I can also watch Netflix and Amazon. And you're not and you having any problems there. None whatsoever. 
I have plenty of download speed. Uh, that has nothing to do with it. So I, so I don't know. <laughs> it's really an inter okay, It's please. an interesting conundrum because. Um, I thought possibly it was an op operating system upgrade that they may have done when they went from. Oh, so this didn't always do it. It just started recently. Yes, just just the last this last year, and I've had a couple of. And calls it's always the second now. song. It's never. It's never. Does it happen again after that? Yes. Yes. When does it happen? Every time a song changes? Oh, not quite. It, it once once I get to the first one, it may play two more song cuts, and then on the third song, it'll stall again. Right at the first two to three seconds, and uh, and occasionally when I hit enter again on the button to get it going to to stop it, then start it again. You know the song choice. Uh, it'll it'll skip right out of that song and into the next song. What? Oh, okay. Show, but still show the album cover. You know. Okay. As the okay. Sheet. So but, that that oh, that's really interesting. So let me see if I can recruit. See if I got this right. So you're listening to this song, blah 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 blah. All of a sudden, the stereo starts playing the next song. But on the TV screen, you're looking at the TV screen to see the album art? Where do you see the album art? A TV or on the computer? Yeah, so so visually, you know, I can see what's being played. Right, on the TV, right? On the TV, yeah. on my television, yeah. yes. So the, so the music changes, but the TV screen does not? Correct. Well, yes. Okay. Yeah. Now I understand why Apple told you what they told you. They feel they feel it's a corrupt, corrupted library. or, or the, So then they had me... So what they did one time is they had me reload an album back in, delete the album, and yeah. then reload it back in. Yeah, yeah. import it yeah. again. Yeah. And I did. And for Same that thing. moment, whilst I had the tech team on the telephone, it seemed to work flawlessly. And then it went bad later. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I understand now because that extra data point... Um, which they had, that actually means that they're not as nutty as they sounded. So we've eliminated Wi-Fi. It's not. It's hardwired. Uh, and it doesn't really matter how the Apple TV is connected to the television. That's that's neither here nor there, I don't think. I mean, it could, but I think we can eliminate that. And by hardwiring, we're eliminating Wi-Fi issues. There still could be port issues. But I'm thinking Apple uh, actually is steering you correctly at this point. Um. Oh, Miller Tech says it's not AirPlay because you're using the computer app on the Apple TV. That's home sharing. Yes. Yeah. On the yeah. Okay. So that is over the network home sharing. And, and remind, remember, I can do this with either computer. In other words, I've got my library on two different computers. And, and the same I thing. Even compare and the same thing happens on both computers. Same identical thing on either computer and on either Apple TV. Interesting. Yes. So it's, um, a home, it's a home sharing issue. If that's the case, it seems unlikely that it's the library. It seems maybe more likely that it's home sharing having an issue, maybe with router configuration, although that home sharing pretty much is designed to bypass that. I don't do anything tricky with my routers or you know, my modem. Um, I just use them stock out of the box, except I change, you know, the password and and, and keys. Yeah. Uh, then, I, like I said, I just I just received a brand new router, updated router. I'm looking at a MacWorld column called "Hey Apple, Fix This." Apple's home sharing. Why is troubleshooting it so painful? <laughs> <laughs> and it is painful because it's very complicated. There is an Apple support document, How to Troubleshoot Home Sharing. It's HT203311. And what, uh, use the same Apple ID across all your devices. So you're using the same Apple account on all of the devices, right? That's correct. Same iCloud account. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I'm not sure why that's relevant. But if all the devices are using the same account, check your network connection. You don't have a VPN, right? Oh, no VPN. No guest network? No. No. Restart and update your router is one thing they say. Check for ports. They do mention this port and firewall issue. So you, if you go to support.apple.com and search for 203 311 you might look at these steps. It's a seven-step process. You've done all of them except the last two, which is the port issue. Port so issue. So I would look at the ports. They list the ports there. Make sure that those ports or particular ports aren't closed or blocked. Uh, and then, and that would that would centralize it to the router, which we, we're going to have to because it's something in common to both computers and both Apple TVs. They also say you may want to deauthorize and reauthorize, just, you know, st set it up again. I would make sure firmware is up to date. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a tricky one. It's interesting. And it, what I'm trying to form in my mind is a model of why the music is doing this. And it's just the music, nothing else. Yeah. But you don't play, have you played videos from your computer to your TV? No, I, I don't have any of that. Okay, um, you might try that, just, you know, get some other local content besides music. I bet you the same thing will happen, the stuttering problem. And I'm, because that's basically, it's what it is. It's stuttering, or it's actually stopping, and you have to restart it, isn't it? Cause yeah. It, it, it'll just sit there, unless you restart it, it'll just sit there forever, right? Sit there forever, yeah. unless I... So it's stopping. And I've, I've reset the bolt Apple TV. One thing I would try, just for grins, is unplug one of the Apple TVs. I've done that. And it still happens. Yes. Because, you know, if, they're, if the two of them are, conf are on the same, they're all on the same network, and maybe one of them is interfering with the other. But you've tried unplugging it with just one Apple TV. Well, I, I did because I had... I brought in the one from the living room into the movie room thinking, well, maybe it's the TV itself. And right. Apple TV. Yeah, if you had one Apple TV on the network and maybe un maybe shut down one of the computers, too, and just see. In other words, simplify it as much as possible. Yeah, I haven't done, you know, shut down one of the computers. I maybe do that. try that. So shut down one of the computers, shut down one of the Apple TVs. So you have one and one only computer doing home sharing and one and one only Apple TV doing home sharing. And see if that works. Uh, Darn. I uh, thought maybe it was something I was missing. Like yeah, it's not obvious, no. Like an OS update or something? Well, you certainly should have all the updates for all the parties. Yeah, and I do. I just, you know, sometimes they update something and you got to live with it. It's all, so Ma to, it's all Macs, right? Yeah, well, no. Okay. I would shut down every computer on the network except one Mac and one Apple TV, and just that see, yeah, really, in other words, get everything off the network, except for those two things, see if if that works. If it doesn't, uh, then we've narrowed it down. If it does work, then slowly add things back till you figure out which one's causing interference. If that, if, that were the case, that would be great. Cause yes, because you could figure it out. Then... Uh, so let's say it's still happening with the simplest possible network. One router, one computer, one Apple TV. There's only three devices on the whole network, and it's still happening. Then there's really only a few possibilities. One, there's something with the router, maybe ports, maybe the router itself is... You know, sometimes weird things happen with routers uh, that cause a disconnect, um, and, and maybe a, a, just a different router would fix it. Uh, it's not probably not ports. It wouldn't work at all if there were port issues. It's probably something, you know, what if the router, for instance, um, froze or got weird, you know, or maybe that there's too much traffic going through it and it said, ah, I'm too hot and it stopped for a little bit, something like that. And, and it's blocking the traffic at that point, the Apple, the, the iTunes would say, well, I'm going to stop playing and that would do it. Or it's possible that as you're playing, there's something... See, I don't think it is the corrupt library because it happens with all songs, right? It doesn't matter what you're playing. Correct. Yeah, it doesn't matter which album I'm playing. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would start 
just simplify the network as much as possible. Ideally, just router, computer, and Apple TV, and see what happens. I should. I'll. I'll try that. If right. you have a firewall or any other security software, or anything like that, little snitch, anything like that, turn that all off. No, I even went so far as to think that well, maybe it's because it's the old. I have an old Mac Pro. That's my first server. I call it yeah. and. Just then I have a Windows, uh, Windows. Yeah, do a Mac, if you can, the Mac Pro to the to the router to the Apple TV. Everything else is off the network. If you can do that, I know that's a pain, but if you can do that, start so, there. So what you're saying, Leo, is that these, like my... Um, you're going to el eliminate interference, basically. Wireless extenders. Yeah. Causing an issue. Eliminate, yeah. Eliminate all interference possibilities. Okay. Have it be as simple a network as possible. And see if it operates. If it does, that's, you hope it does. Because then that means, oh, it's the network. There's something about the network configuration. Maybe something is, yeah, exactly. Wi-Fi extenders took that moment to interrogate the base. You have extenders, that's, that could easily be it. Could that moment to interrogate the base route, the, w, the access point. And the access point said, wait, hold on. I can't play music right now. I'm talking to the extender. Boom. Okay. See what I'm saying? Get this yeah. as simple and clean as possible. The other thing is, how old is the router? Well, it's brand new. I just got it oh, um, okay. uh, Monday. Oh, but it happened before, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, that's well, that's good news. That's good news. It means it wasn't the router. Uh, well, that's, yeah, because that's what I was blaming it on. Was yeah, you got a brand new router? What's the router? What kind of router you have? It's uh, it's the one that uh, Verizon FiOS used. Now it's called Frontier. It's the it's the better one that they have. Okay. Well, you got a new router. That's good news. Aris. It's an Aris. A R. -R yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what they use. It's a good. It, the good news is, it's not the router because it wouldn't still happen. But it, I'm thinking now, if you have ex you have a complicated network, it sounds like. I do. Yeah. I do. Strip it all down and see if it does it. And if it does, it's because networks are doing all sorts of other stuff. And it could be with a with streaming anything. the 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 key is the packets have to arrive in order, on time, <laughs> in real time. It's a real time thing. And 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 if it gets busy doing something else, QoS or whatever, it could just interrupt it. And the Apple might just say, "Oh, well, never mind." Yeah, I'm okay. done. I'm done here. It's 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 home sharing is probably not the most robust protocol, and a robust protocol would continue playing. For instance, it might pause, but it would continue on. Yeah, I've tried DLNA. That, like you were saying, that's oh, uh, that's worse. That was a nightmare. Yeah, I would uh, take a look at read read up on home sharing because that's the issue. Uh, but I think simplifying the network, see how that works. If that if that doesn't fix it, or even if it does, if it does fix it, you still now you want to figure out what's going on, what what's getting in the way, and slowly add things back till it starts again. All right, I'll give that a go, Leo. You got a, a day of troubleshooting ahead. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> thank you so much, and enjoy your vacation. All right, thank you. Take care. Thanks for helping me out. Right. All right, take care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. On we go with the show. Let's go to Paris. Let's all go to Paris. Oh, Paris, California. Uh, Dave, do you have an Eiffel Tower, Dave, in Paris? Oh, we oui, oui. We have the <laughs> Eiffel Tower. <laughs> I've heard of Paris, Texas. I didn't know there was a Paris, California. That's that's cool. There, yeah, there's a Paris, California just outside of Riverside. Oh, all right. I know where that is. What can I do for you, Dave? Okay, I have a quick question. I have a YouTube channel, and I do live streaming for. By the way, um, it's P-E-R-R-I-S, right? Yes. Ah, uh, see, Kim was teasing me. She spelled it Paris. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Say say again. You said you have a Roku? Uh, no, uh, YouTube channel. YouTube. Oh, you're a YouTuber. Stream. Tell me about your YouTube yeah. channel. My channel is called The Wombat Says. It's mostly reviews, and there's some comedy and other stuff. And I've been teaching uh, guitar on there. Doing oh, some fun. Free guitar lessons. Isn't that and, fun? You know, live streams. Do you like it? It's fun. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's and you, a hobby. I work full time, so it's just something to do on the side. And I don't care what they say, Dave. You do not look like a wombat. <laughs> I've seen a wombat. 
I've known a wombat. I took a picture of a wombat in Tasmania as it came trundling toward me. You look nothing like a wombat, but it's a good name for a channel. The wombat says, fun. So what can I do to help you with uh, your channel? Well, this looks hysterical, okay. by the way. I love this. <laughs> I am going to be a regular. I'm watching this from now on. That's hysterical. <laughs> So anyways, um, I, I found when I do live streaming um, over my internet, it works a lot better with my LG smartphone than going directly through the computer using a Logitech webcam. And I just kind of wondered why that might be. And in both cases, you're using the, lo the, the local Wi-Fi, not, right? I mean, you're not using the LG smartphone's, you know, LTE connection, or are you? Uh, no, I'm using uh, the Wi-Fi connection the wi in both situations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so in theory, that should be uh, similar. Uh, when you say better, what are the what are the problems you face when you do it on the computer? What goes wrong? Um, just the quality. Um, is sometimes frame rate lower, bit, or is it grainier? It's it's just uh, the the whole tone is is grayer. It's grayer. darker. Okay. Sometimes there's a lot of uh, distortion in the image. Yeah, I mean, it may be that Logitech camera. Which Logitech are you using? Um, I was using the C270, and then I got uh, the 930. I like the 930. Better. Yeah, that's the much more modern one. And then I went back to using the, the C270 because the image was actually better. Isn't that funny? Oh, my. Uh, we use, you know, as you know, if on our podcast network, we use Skype a lot, and we use uh, Logitech cameras and have very good results. But that's in a case where the lighting is good. So one way you can help this is better lighting. And then you're going to want to maybe use the software that came with that camera. Are you doing it on a Mac or PC? Uh, PC. So the Mac, <clears throat> the Mac uh, doesn't have the software for the 930 uh, or, or the older one. Maybe it does for the older one, but the modern ones don't have Mac software. But on the PC, there's software, and you can use that to play with color saturation, lighting, and stuff. Are you moving around a lot, or are you just sitting in front of the PC? Uh, pretty stagnant because it's it doesn't track me very well when I move at all. That's right. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think yeah. what you're experiencing here is that 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 uh, LG has a better camera. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what you're seeing. <laughs> um, I have never compared them head to head, but if you think about it, uh, there's such a um, race to get the best camera on a phone, and LG's cameras uh, are very very good. They're they're up there with Samsung and Apple. And I think maybe uh, there's better software behind it. They're processing it faster. Uh, it, it, you know, your chip in your phone isn't maybe as fast as your desktop, but it's close and it's tuned to do a better job with photography. A lot of times we look at things like the, you know, the, the megahertz speed of a chip or we look at how many cores it has as if that's mm -hmm. the most important thing in a chip. And really, in, and Apple's proven this, chip design benefits a lot if you know ahead of time what that chip's going to be used for you can make it better at the things it does smartphones and tablets generally use chips that are a little bit customized for that particular environment particularly for the cameras so the general purpose process in your pc may not be supporting the camera as well and since the camera isn't part of the pc but it's a separate third-party tool I, this doesn't surprise me i think you should use a phone Get a tripod for it. Get good lights. System. All of that will benefit, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and your phone yeah, can. Even with a lot of lights, it it does, it does the same thing. So I'll just probably use my phone. Just keep using on. the phone. I like the wombat. I'm gonna watch more of the wombat. It's you. <laughs> I have a second quick question for you. Yeah. Um, is there any way I can link my Outlook to my TRS-80? <laughs> Stop it. Go away. <laughs> Go away. Go away. Go do your little video thing. Don't bug me anymore. I know you're joking. I know you're teasing. The Wombat oh, yeah. says YouTube.com. Dave, you're great. I can't wait to watch more of it. I like the banana soda one. That's funny. Oh, thank you very much. Filbert's old time quality banana soda, folks. You, you really look like a wombat with that fake mustache. Yeah, is this going to be? I think it might. The last call of the day. I'm going to cry. Aaron, Hannibal, Missouri, home of Tom Sawyer. Hello, Aaron. Hey, how are you? I'm well. Thanks how are you? Call. Well, thanks for calling. I'm doing great. Uh, I got a quick question. Hopefully it's going to be quick about my NAS. I have a Synology 
DS918 plus. Very nice. I'm a 1515 guy myself. Love my Synology NAS. NAS is a network yeah, actually, attached storage. It's a really big yeah. hard drive. Does it's actually a computer with a really big hard drive. It doesn't have a keyboard, mouse, and monitor though. You control it via the network, and it can do all sorts of things, not just for backup. Yeah, I really love it. I got it on your suggestion from oh, good. about a year ago. Oh, good. Uh, maybe not that model, but just looked into the Synology system, and it works out great. I love it. It's awesome. But uh, I'm one of the things I'm having problems with is I'm a, I do a lot of large image files, yeah. either graphic designs or photos, TIFFs a lot of times, and they're just really slow to load in thumbnails. Like, I want to, like, look through, like, let's say 50 images to see which one I want to pick or which one I want to look at, but I'm just waiting, waiting, you're, you're, waiting for But you're it. loading them across the network from the NAS. I, I It does. I have, when I, I have one computer that's wired to the NAS, and... On there, it, it is a lot quicker, obviously, yeah. but there's, there's still a tiny bit of lag. And then, yeah, obviously, when I try to do it, like, on a map drive or, like, you know, on my right. phone when I'm out in the world, it's just awful. It's, like, so, it's so, so slow. Of course, when you are going through the public Internet, which you're doing on your phone, uh, right. it's going to be slow because, think about this, uh, it's using your upload speed. So most of us, when we buy Internet access... We buy, we look at the big number, you know, 50 megabits right. down. We don't look at the little number, two megabits up. But a NAS, it's in your house. When you're accessing from outside, it's uploading to you. It's using that slow, that small number. Okay. So absolutely, that's why it's slow on a phone. It's not as fast. And really, NASs shouldn't be thought of as cloud storage that you can easily access. It's really more... I would think of it more as a one-way street. And you okay. should also make sure when you're accessing it at home that you're not accessing it through the Internet. You may be, which means that you're going out to the Internet and then going down to the NAS. The NAS then goes up via your upload speed to your okay. computer. So, And so, most of the time, that's how a NAS is going to work. If you're getting to your NAS with the IP address of the oh, NAS. No, map the drive to like my my like let's say I have a laptop in the kitchen or something. I have it mapped through so I can actually okay. see the drive like when I go to my computer. That should be full even speed. There, that should be over your land. Even there yeah. it seems very it's just it has a huge lag. And I know they like I try to do some research online there's like uh, RAM and things you can put into is that going to make it any faster or is that Yeah, on my bottleneck. Uh, it's expensive. But uh on the Synology I use you can add RAM, and I did add RAM to it. I don't know if that makes it faster. I think it's more likely it lets you do more things or run more complicated software. Synology is neat because you can do your own mail server, web server. You can have a Git. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, you run GitLab on it. But for that, I think the RAM is useful, and I did put more RAM in it for that. I don't know if it would speed you up. I really don't. Um, there's, there's not really a way. It's I'm basically just bottlenecked in the... Yeah, I think you shouldn't think of your uh, Synology NAS as kind of local storage. I think that's right. the problem. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. I'm just trying to think of a way that I have a library of all these... I know. I have a job where they want a, an image sent to them right away, and I'm like, okay, so then I have to try... Shouldn't to be shouldn't be horribly slower, but it sounds like it is. Yeah, well, sometimes I'll just wait and it'll just hang. Like, it never actually... And then you have to, like, you know, right-click and refresh. And then after, like, three or four times, maybe... There's maybe something wrong the there. will start to low. Okay. There's something wrong there. That should not happen, especially when it's mapped. If okay. you're using the IP address to get to it, um, yeah. you know, if you're using, like, the Synology programs, the file. Yeah, yeah, the then file you're going through the Internet. That is going to be right. slow. But if you're yeah, mapping it, if you make yeah. sure you've turned on uh, SMB file sharing, you know, Windows file sharing. Is it a Windows machine? It is, yeah. yeah. There are two Windows machines. Make sure yeah. you turn on SMB file sharing. Look in the, I think maybe it's a misconfiguration at some point. Okay, great. Wow, well, thank you. I'll, I guess I'll just keep noodling. With that. Noodle on that one. Yeah, that should be fast. Of course, it's going to be slow when you're going over the Internet because it's your upload speed. But when you map it as if it's a local drive, it's going over the network, it should be at it least as fast be. as your network is. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks thank for the for call. Thank you for taking my call. Of course. Thank you for calling. Have fun on your vacation. I will.
<laughs> Thanks for helping me go. <laughs> Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So next week, it's going to be a little different. I am, uh, as uh, you heard the caller say, I'm heading out for vacation. Rich Demuro from KTLA will be filling in. I know you love Rich. He'll be here for the next two weekends. So make sure you, uh, you join us for the Tech Guy Show featuring Rich Demuro. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Take care. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.